go on perfect and we are live all right guys this is the meet and shoot whoa what is this this is a meet shoot a speed light introduction class uh essentially what this one is is a really fun one where we uh we talk about speed lights and uh, here's where i'm going to go ahead and admit something um this can thing can either be both really advanced or really beginning and uh we made it both and so today's class will cover everything pretty much. Uh, I should have charged you guys for this class. I'm not going to. I really got enthusiastic about it. It's, it doesn't seem as long as it is, but it's like 36 slides. And so uh, the reason why I'm mentioning this is there are people of different skill levels here. Ask questions. Uh, everyone, something I love about Meet and Shoot is you guys are always patient with each other and you're helpful to each other and so forth. And we know there's people of all skill levels here. If something goes over your head, this is your opportunity to ask us. If you feel like it's, or I'll go ahead and tell you, it's a question that's going to take a while. That's why we have other members here. We have Chris here today. We have a, a few others, and they'll sit and chat with you concerning anything about speed lights. And so, all right, let me go ahead and hide this. Let me see what this says. All right, guys, I'll talk, talk about it a little bit more in just a little bit, but meet and shoot. Uh, we are me, Trent Chow, Chris Warwick, who's over there. Uh, Jamie Moore, who's not here tonight because he's with this lady. I'm going to go ahead and mention that just to pick on him. And uh, Patrick Sun, who hopefully will be here a little bit later. Uh, also, one of our admins for our page is here from Alaska. Where is he? Joel. Um, he's not here all the time, but he is one of the administrators for our Facebook page. So if you ever put up something and you don't follow our rules and it gets deleted, it's his fault. So go talk to him if uh, anyone has that happened. But um, we are meeting you guys in. You know, it's been fun. We've been doing this for a while. Uh, the venue is provided by Mike. Uh, Mike is here or, yep. Uh, this is a great place, guys. Unbeatable price. For $50, if you get a membership here, you get two studio hours. So you get to come in here, you get to shoot. Mike already decided about a few months ago, hell, you could, you could use the equipment that's already set up here. So not only do you get two studio hours, you also get studio equipment you can use. And so the reason why I like pushing this place, guys, winter's coming in. You can shoot. You can partner up with a few other friends. It isn't 50 bucks for both of you guys. You're going to have to pay a little bit more of a premium for both of you guys to shoot together. But it's a studio, climate control, over your head, dressing room, conference room, all that for a starting price of 50 bucks for two hours. It's unbeatable. So talk to Mike Noah. He'll get you in the door. Uh, it's a great program. He, he, gives us a, uh, he gives us a free session every month to go ahead and host these classes too. And so we've had a really great relationship with him there. As always, they're sponsored by Aperture Rent. If you use the code MeetShoot10, Chris has mentioned it a little bit earlier, you get 10% off your total order. Um, it's a great thing, mostly if anyone here um, with, the, um, with vacation time and holiday season coming in, if you're going to go overseas and you have your camera, rent one, guys. Because one of the things, for those who don't know, is you can rent with full insurance and you can rent a lens and all that, and it's going to be kind of like worry-free. There's something else when you go out there with your D800 and you're in Italy and you're kind of worried about that. You don't want to lug it around with you everywhere, but, you know, so on. Uh, well, if you don't want a big camera, you want to try something out, go rent a Sony a7R. Great full frame, small camera. Get a lens with it. Get it fully insured. You're out there taking a vacation. You're fully insured with your equipment. You're, you're taking photos and you have a smaller camera. So those are some of the, some of the ways where renting equipment can uh, be in your benefit there. Uh, the instructor tonight, some of you guys have seen this before. It's the most half-assed slide in the uh, thing. I'm Trent. I've been a photographer for a while. I teach a bunch of things about photography. Feel free to talk to me anytime about that. And there's my portfolio site. So check it out if you guys have a chance. Uh, I've been shooting for a while. So any questions? Nope. All right. A little bit more about me and shoot, guys. We are an organized photography meetup group based in Atlanta, Georgia. There's a lot of new faces here, so I'm going to go ahead and go through with this. Uh, what we promise to deliver is amazing photo shoot, great workshops and classes, uh, stellar models, well-planned themes, and high-end equipment, and create a great, unique experience. At uh, the core of it all, one of our mission statements is we will not do something or we will not host a shoot we wouldn't shoot ourselves. And so uh, we have, you know, um, we are professional photographers here. We've shot for a while. But what that means to us is if it means 10 with three lights each, there will be 10 setups with three lights each. There isn't a one light setup and okay, we're going to half ass it because it's just other people. If we're not going to shoot it ourselves, we wouldn't host the event. And so um, that's what we mean kind of concerning amazing shoots, uh, photo shoots and stuff like that. 
The way I equate it to people is, who here goes to a nice restaurant, takes their wife or their husband out to a nice restaurant? Anyone here? I mean, most of us all. Yeah, everyone here. You pay for a good meal. You pay for the experience. You don't worry about it. Someone cooks it for you. Someone cleans it for you. You have that. That's what meat shoot is. We set up a shoot for you. We set up a class. You come there. You enjoy the service. You enjoy the experience. You get what you want. You leave. You're happy. And we handle all the internals. We handle getting the ingredients. We handle all of that. And we just deliver a, a nice product or a nice product. And so, as always, we have cool shoots in the pipeline. Check out our meetup.com page and our website. Shoots can range from free to members, which we'll talk about to a little bit, or to a very low cost. All right. So the membership program. This is a membership event tonight. So what is that? Well, you pay twenty-five dollars for the year. I see a couple checks and a couple uh, um, uh, some cash up there. Um, so for, me, for probably from some new members here. Um, you pay for the year, and what we do is we host, about two a month now, we host member events. And they are free education courses, they're shoots, they're uh, just pretty, pretty fun things that you do photography-wise. Uh, these events are for members only. Uh, so what we are doing now, too, is also streaming these events online. You guys have probably noticed that there was about 60 RSVPs. I think it's down to about 57 now. About half of them are online. That's amazing. Because the, the other cool thing about this is we don't really hide anything about what we do, and it's all archived. So if you're a member and you just became a member, you can see all of our streams online. And you can go revisit them, and the cool part is there's a Lightroom one that I have up there. The reason why I love it is I show you how to edit in Lightroom. If you miss something, you just rewind it and rewatch it. You can watch it slowly, stuff like that. So that's one of the benefits of uh, the archiving there. With that, there's always a plus if you come in person. Tonight, we have Erin here. She brought her snake. She has a great outfit. You can shoot tonight, too, if you brought your camera. So you can work with the models. There's always a little bit more that we do. And something that we, uh, this seems a little bit mean, is we only stream online. We don't, or we don't answer questions yet of anyone who's not here. It's kind of a privilege that you guys have. If you make it in person, we'll answer your questions. But we don't have anyone monitoring a chat room online to see any questions that anyone online may have. So if you're ever wondering why, if you should make it to an event in the future, if you have questions concerning that general topic, that's how you're going to get them answered. All right. Um, we do have other shoots and events members do have to pay for. Uh, so please look for member events in the title, and those are fully available for members. Uh, essentially, with your $25 membership a year, guys, you end up paying about $1.50 per event, which is which is a great deal. Uh, something I will go ahead and say is I might, or we might, because uh, uh, I might, or sorry, we might put up a, uh, a link soon. We do need your help. Uh, I love the streaming aspect. Something I'm not a big fan of streaming-wise yet is it's a static camera. And so I'm trying to figure a solution where we can, uh, when we're broadcasting online, we're actually going to broadcast with a, a camera and someone manning the camera and zooming in to whatever we're doing. And so we are looking to improve your online experience when it comes to this. But because of that, we may ask for any members who either have experience or anyone who just wants to throw a couple more dollars in. Because $25 a year, you guys are probably, it's pretty minimal. And most other, like I think lynda.com, which is a, uh, you know, an education-based site, I think they're monthly where you pay 10, 15, 20 bucks a month. So if anyone's interested in helping us uh, expand that out, look forward to talking to you about that. All right. Next week, guys, we uh, we have a uh, we're breaking in another studio that we're trying out in Atlanta, and we have a costume shoot there. Uh, essentially, these are models who are dressed in uh, uh, fully dressed up in awesome costumes. Things where they're just they're it's jaw dropping stuff, and it's in Tucker, Georgia. So we hope to have you guys. Oh, actually, sorry about the the text. I didn't change that text. I apologize. Essentially, next week, sign up online. It's twenty five bucks for a shoot. We set up a bunch of stations, and it's a great little studio area. We have, you know, black walls, stuff like that, and uh, you'll have you'll have uh, a lot of great costumes that you can shoot, and just a, a great time. So, uh, yeah, avoid the text, guys, and uh, hope to see you next week with that. Also, avoid the guy named Chris that told you earlier it was at the other Alpharetta facility. Don't listen to him. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit too small there, and so uh, this one. We want to bring a few, uh, some of our shoots back closer to Atlanta. A lot of, a lot of our populations here in the um, sort of the northern belt, but uh, we're looking to go back into Atlanta in more of the uh, more of a studio environment. So, all right, guys, one-on-one -on -one lessons. Uh, I teach one-on-one -on -one lessons at our new office in Alpharetta, which is one Chris was talking about. 
Um, this is really cool here, guys. Uh, I love, I love facility education. But the problem about being in a classroom is you have 10 people who are hungry to learn, and you have one teacher who has to kind of, you know, make all of them happy. In a two-hour window or so on, it really doesn't work. You end up getting 10, 15 minutes with your, uh, you know, with your instructor. With this, though, uh, there's a couple of faces. I saw, I see a smile on Mark back there. Uh, I can promise you guys with the one-on-one -on -one lessons, they're fun. And they hit exactly what you want. And uh, there, if you've noticed, uh, it says here it ranges from two to two and a half hours. Mark, can you tell them how our sessions go? There really isn't a time limit, right? Yeah, so like, I'll charge you per session. There's a lot of great people who are like, hey, you gave me more than I expected. Here's a little bit more money. I don't necessarily care about that. For anyone who's wondering, I am not one of those people who say, hey, it's two hours, get out of here. Um, and so we cover what you need to know. The thing is, I will talk to you about what you need to know, but it's kind of like, all right, tell me what you want to do. Tell me what you're, you know, um, you know we'll do, a, we do a general consultation first, and then the education starts from there. And um, I'm big. And not just telling you like how I would do it or why, but every all the answers. Like the main thing is not all right. This is how you do it, and this is how you always do it. It's this is how you do it. Why? And this is what you're going to encounter, problem wise in the future. And this is how you troubleshoot it. You know, when I'm not there with you, can you do it on your own? That's that's the most important thing. I know it sounds silly saying it, but it's kind of like a parent. Some of us are parents here. Our children will fail. That's perfectly fine, but it's great when they can pick themselves up from what you've taught them and they can move forward with that. And so it's kind of the education uh, style that I push. All right, so guys, contact me later if you're interested. Some fun stuff on the side for anyone who draws. We're not gonna say on this too much. We started a new group called the Alpharetta Casual Portraiture Drawing and Painting Meetup. Um, reason why I'm gonna go ahead and say for you guys, for anyone here, Maybe you don't draw, maybe you don't do any of that. Come check it out anyways, because it's how to interact with the model. It's how to see posing, it's how to do all that. We take the lighting that we do at meet and shoot and we apply it in an art environment. And so you can actually interact with the model, talk to the model, and also even book work with the model, because a lot of them hybrid photography and art models. So for anyone who's looking for models, this is a way to do it. But for anyone who's even just interested in learning how to pose models, this is, these are one of those things that you can do. Uh, uh, something like this is something you can do to start learning it. All right, guys. Uh, today's, model is, uh, today's model is Aaron. She's getting ready. But yeah, if, uh, if you guys shoot with her tipper, uh, please tip the model if you can. I mean, it's completely optional if you guys want to shoot or not here. But she's amazing. And yep, so it's outstanding. So yep. <laughs> And so yeah, it's really it's really unique experience. Uh, we love her. Uh, she's here. Uh, she's doing also the November 11th film noir old Hollywood shoot, which has a few other models too. And she was our last year. She was our snake charmer, and uh, just absolutely gorgeous. So um, we will have her uh, posing for a little bit later. And if we can get a chair for her, Joel, or so forth, because it's a lot of sitting in the beginning. All right, guys. Now for the class, speed light introduction. What is this about? All right. Lighting is absolutely what everything for, is about photography. No matter what we do, no matter what we shoot, if it's, you know, if it's a muffin, if it's a kid, if it's a child, if it's a mountain, the only thing we're actually capturing is how light hits it. No matter what your subject is, all photography is, is how light hits it and how it's perceived by your camera. And so saying such, being able to bring and use a powerful light with you anywhere is one of the most skillful, uh, or skillful, or useful tools and skills as we can have, or we can have as a photographer. So the lecture is about a speed light, a little device that puts out light, uh, puts on an enormous amount of light, and lets you, you know, bring your photography to the next level. This lecture introduces the portable battery-powered speed light unit and talks about all the magic you can do with one little simple tool which is this guy right here. This $100 device and how it can really change your photography. So make sure this one's on. All right. Here's a list of some of the things we'll talk about today, guys. What is a speed light? Which one works with what camera? ETTL and manual, what is that about? Uh, triggering the speed light, modifying the speed light, getting the most out of a speed light, understanding limitations and benefits. Uh, here's a couple, there's gonna be a couple eye-opening things for you. Uh, and those and that right there and what speed light might be best for you 
As always, feel free to ask any questions while I'm doing this. If it pertains like to something that's on screen, I'll answer it immediately. But if it's something where you're kind of like thinking, hey, should I ask it now or later? Do ask it during some time. And um, you know, I'll give you an honest answer with that. All right, um, and if not, Chris will too. So if you, don't see anything, if, you, if you don't see anything up here that you wish was covered, we would talk, or we can talk about it also. Just feel free to ask questions. All right, so what we aren't covering, guys, this is an introduction to speed lights, and that's un or, and speed lights that are universal to all camera systems. Speed lights are uh, on one part very, very proprietary. There's Canon, there's the Canon system, there's an Icon system, there's the Sony system, you know, the Canon system um, has certain, um, certain aspects about it. The, uh, the CLS system from Nikon is completely different than Canon, which now went to a radio solution, stuff like that. We're not gonna really necessarily get into in depth about each system because you can have individual classes with them. But if you ask a general question, I would actually say, I hate saying this, if you're more of a Nikon or a Canon shooter, feel free to ask it because it might help a lot of people here. But if it's something deep and involving, it really is, hey, just ask me that later and we'll talk about it. I'm a Canon guy, Chris is a Nikon guy. If anyone has any questions concerning those two specific systems, feel free to ask or talk to the person who is probably more than likely comfortable with that system. All right, so in this, in this class we'll, ask, uh, we'll answer general questions. Uh, this lecture is meant for dummy type manual speed lights, ones that pretty much you set the power ratio on it and you either tell it to trigger or not to trigger. So a basic speed light unit. All right. And as, um, as such, I will go ahead and say this. This class is a beginner or an introduction. So some of you guys are, guys are going to know this. Some of you aren't. We're really actually we're going to break it down to the anatomy of the speed light first and a few things there. Uh, something that um, Dino, um, Dino told me two years ago, which was important to me, was he tries to leave every class knowing three new things. I'm going to go ahead and bet that you guys are going to learn five at least five, everyone here. So the slideshows have a lot of fun, like little neat tidbits about it. But with that, it's not just us teaching. If you guys know anything yourself from personal experience, feel free to share it with us from your experience working with speed lights. But a speed light unit itself is a self-contained flash unit that is battery operated. I wanna go ahead and say this, guys, a light is a light. Everything that you learn in today's introduction can be applied to every type of flash unit. So if you buy a studio strobe, the modifiers also are modular and go to a studio strobe. If we talk about moving a light around, it works with a studio strobe. They, a light is a light. And so just go ahead, uh, just go ahead and be aware of that. Uh, while you're working with your small typical speed light units, anything taught in this class can be applied to any light. Who here doesn't have a speed light at all? Are you looking to buy one or? Mm -hmm. Uh, so who here has one? Like most everyone here does. I mean, it varies. Do you guys have your own manufacturer's speed light and so forth? And then some of you guys may have third party ones. It's good to have one. So what should you look for? Spare, uh, speed lights vary in price and options. The most ideal ultimately as a photographer is one that allows manual control. And so the 420 EX from Canon, and does anyone have one? It's an older one. Problem with the 420 is it works, but it's automatic only. You can't manually say, I want this specific power setting. The reason that uh, it's a bad thing on automatic, guys, is when you're on automatic, your camera's analyzing the scene and it says, this is what I think it should be. If you slightly vary the angle of your camera, that power setting could be completely different. And I'll go ahead and say this, the, sci the scientific process person in me kind of needs that control and needs that, the ability to lock down a number and consistently stay there. And so when you buy a flash, all of them now should allow you to manually control them. But if you have an older flash, it might be time to go ahead and say, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and go to the newer ones because the newer flashes, you can get them for 80 bucks, 90 bucks, and they're, full, they're fully equipped now. It's gotten to that point in time now where with all the options from China and so forth, flashes have gone down extremely uh, low in price while giving you these options that used to cost five to six hundred dollars uh, six years ago. All right. The other thing is movement flexibility. An articulating head is one of the most important things that you can get for a flash later down the line. So if anyone's looking for a flash 
and you have the option. I know mostly Canon numbers, so apologize. I apologize to Nikon people. There's a Canon 270EX. It's a flash. It only forces or only points face forward, and then it points up. You know, it has movement, but you know, it has restricted movement. You go to the 430 or the 370, and all of a sudden you have an articulating head that can point in any direction. You want you know, the, the better idea is to have a flash with an articulating head, and that's movement. So look for both of these options on the body of the flash. All right. Um, is there any questions before I move on, guys? Yeah, actually, I will go ahead and suggest that in a little bit. There's a slide, I believe it's uh, two slides from now, and we'll go ahead and talk about that. All right, guys, so going back to the articulating head, when looking for a speed light, once again, try to find one. It's one of those things where it's really useful. The only thing to note, though, is some speed lights will lock if they're in a certain area. Don't force it, it'll break. It sucks. Like this one will stop going from this direction, and you have to go the other way before you can go further. And so if you feel a hard stop, make sure you don't do anything. Also, some of them have uh, buttons and so forth. And one last thing, any Canon users here, you have one neutral pose here and one further down. If your camera accidentally gets hit, gets pushed further down, you'll lose half your automatic settings. And so you want to slightly adjust it back up. It's really weird, but for any 580 EX users or any 600, if it gets tapped down, all of a sudden your menus will start flashing. You don't know what's going on. You just tap it slightly up. So it's one of those things where uh, you want to be aware of that. Um, all right, so articulating head, you guys are good there. All right, the bottom of the speed light, the hot shoe. On the bottom of the speed light, something called a hot shoe. The center pin is a universal firing pin. This is where it's important for you guys. If you, um, if you look on this flash, there's, a, there's five pins right here. This center pin right here is a dummy flash pin. If you, be, if you get another flash, let me go ahead and... That's just a pure manual flash. A pure manual flash, you'll see it just has one pin, right guys? Why that's relevant to you is I could put, let's say this is a Canon flash right here that has that center pin. I could put it on your Nikon camera and fire it because it fires the center pin. If I try using an older Sony, the one that has a Minolta, a conical Minolta slide on it, you're gonna have to get a converter. But when you buy the converter for a hot shoe, you're gonna notice that it has a silver or it has a conductive point right where the center pin is. You can all of a sudden use this flash on a Sony. The problem is, is the, the extra pins that you see on the bottom are the ones that are communicating data back and forth with the flash. You don't have automatic settings on those flashes if you're just using the dummy center pin. Um, but the important thing to note here is anyone can grab this flash right here, put it on top of and have a usable flash. And so it's pretty useful there. And as you get used to it, yes, automatic is great, but sometimes you are caught in a foobar situation and you need a flash. You go to your bag, you grab one of these, you put it on your camera, you adjust the power manually, so you're going to have to learn how to do that, but all of a sudden you have a working flash on your camera. So one of the cool things is when you guys buy one of these, it is a flash that you can put on top of your camera that works just like a normal generic hot shoe flash. All right, does anyone have an old, um, oh my God, what was the, uh, the 280 VC, or I'm trying to remember that old flash, the... Uh, to 285, the Vivitars. Yeah. Does anyone have the older Vivitars before the, like the HC or whatever designation? They had a lot of power. They had a lot of power. The only problem is on the hot shoe, uh, about when digital came in, um, it doesn't require that much of a voltage to go through the hot shoe. If a, if a great, great uncle or an uncle or someone gives you a flash and it's an old Smith or, so, or if it's an old Vivitar, uh, if it's older than 20 years old, it will fuck your camera up because it actually sends a large amount of voltage through the, uh, through the hot shoe. So uh, I know it's strong language, guys, but be careful because it's taken out a lot of cameras. Um, so that's why uh, Vivitar has uh, released one like 10 years ago, eight years ago, that doesn't release the same amount of voltage out. So older flashes, make sure to look up on Google or so on and see how much voltage is going through the hot shoe because if too much is going through, it's going to fry the circuits on your camera. 
and your camera's gonna stop working. Um, try not to sound like fearful, so and I just don't want anyone to all of a sudden be like, oh, I'm gonna use this old flash on my camera and all of a sudden it kills your camera. But you can use external, external. You could use external triggers, yep. So, all right, guys. Going to the next one, the anatomy of speed light batteries. Um, you're mostly sitting at the beginning of this, so I'm sorry about that, huh? Um, most flashes, guys, use AA batteries. This is where uh, I'm gonna talk about a little bit more. When you first buy a flash, guys, you're probably gonna use alkalines. That's perfectly fine. Go ahead and get NIM batteries. Uh, NIM is actually older battery tech now, but it's still the better one to use. There's a couple of reasons why, which I'll go over in a second. But the main thing is you get, the more, you get more bang for your buck when it comes to having NIM batteries. And so buy a couple packs of Enter Loops. It's gonna be a little bit more expensive at first. You buy two packs of, uh, or two, four packs of Enter Loops. It's gonna be $21.99, may come with a charger. The reason, there's two factors that come with, or, or sorry, there's multiple factors that NIM batteries work better. Uh, first of all, NIM batteries will charge your flash faster. Uh, I'm trying to remember exactly why, but they have less resistance, I believe. And because they have less resistance, they'll charge the capacitors on your flash faster, and so your performance is increased. So instead of, we're talking micro numbers, but it actually does matter. Instead of taking two seconds to get your flash ready, it takes 1.2 seconds or 1.3, which is extremely significant when you're shooting a wedding and you're doing all of that. Further down the line, as alkalines run out of power, it takes longer for your flash to charge. And so in the beginning, let's say it takes two seconds for your flash to charge, as you use the alkaline batteries and you're at shot 150 or 200, it takes eight seconds. With NIM batteries, it's not as significant. NIM batteries start at 1.2 seconds and then they cap out at about two, 2.3 seconds, something like that, something not even really that bad, three seconds, and then they die. And so not only do you have faster refreshing, you have refreshing that is consistently faster. And so that's the benefit of NIM batteries there. Uh, the Enter Loops that I suggest, Enter Loop was actually just recently bought out by Panasonic, but, uh, or not recently, I think it was 2011. But uh, you'll either find it under Sanyo or uh, Panasonic. They are a neat type of battery technology where when you recharge them and you put them in your bag, they will hold 90% of their capacity for one year. And so you put it in your bag and you just leave it there and you don't really worry about it. Um, you know, but uh, my suggestion is have a backup set of alkalines and then have you know, your NIM batteries that you do charge. For anyone who hasn't bought batteries yet uh, and they're looking for it, there's a company called uh, LaCrosse, L-A-C-R-O-S-S-E. -S -S -E. They make a great charger um, that not only charges the batteries where you can say, okay, I want it to charge 200, 500, 700, 1,000 amps per hour, but you can also refresh and recondition batteries where you put a battery in there, it drains it completely, refills it and rebuilds the memory on it. And so if you have any dead batteries at home, any dead NIM batteries, it'll bring it back to life. And so that charger itself is only $39. I've had those for about two or three years now. And um, if you have an emergency and you really need to charge up a battery fast, it really does degrade your battery life, but it will pump up so you charge it within an hour or you can do a slow trickle charge and also stuff like that. So I have two of those just sitting there. Uh, what's really neat though, and this is something that I've gotten really excited about, thank you to Patrick who, uh, who got the first one, is there are now flashes that have battery packs. And um, Godox and uh, Newer released them and they're what I use now. And there's further benefits to them that make them even better. Uh, so there's these battery packs that slide in and essentially with these battery packs, guys, uh, the annoying factor is if my battery runs out, I can't go to CVS and buy double, or buy double A's. I have to have extra versions or extras of these batteries just laying around. Uh, but the benefit of having a battery pack is I get, our Patrick, you here? Yeah. We get about six to 700 shots per battery comparatively to 200 full power shots. Um, and... Uh, with uh, the thing is, guys, when I say two seconds, that's at full power. I'm rarely ever shooting full power on my flash, so I'm shooting at like one thirty second. And so this battery charges the flash faster because you can go full power in like one point two seconds on that battery. But then on when I'm running it at like one sixty fourth power, it's instantaneous. It's instantly, um, it's instantly ready. So the battery pack helps do that. And then it's seven hundred six to seven hundred full power shots 
So about 4,000 132nd shots. You put one of these in and it's churning through a whole weekend of weddings, stuff like that. And so using these now, I don't actually have to worry about my battery power as much during a wedding. So it's really, um, it's really useful. Uh, the cool part about it too is it's, you know, it's fully manual on this version. It's automatic on this version. I love it. Um, It's, a, it's actually specific to this flash, uh, but the batteries themselves are 30 bucks or $35. I will go ahead and say this. I was really excited about the newer ones, but they, the build quality kind of sucks on the battery end. They had a lot of issues with the batteries, but uh, G-O-D-O-X and uh, I think Cheetah, right, Patrick? Yeah, Cheetah, Cheetah bought the distribution, right? Okay, Cheetah will actually cherry picked all the good ones and actually has a warranty, a year warranty comparatively to a three month warranty. So I can't suggest newer NEE -E or N-E-W-E-E-R anymore. Look at either Cheetah or Godox and look up, uh, it's actually V8CC or uh, I don't remember which one, it's probably TT850 for the uh, Cheetah. And, um, and once again, it's a flash unit that has a battery pack and there's a lot of extra like uh, benefits too. The cool part about it, it it's 100 bucks for the flash, and it comes with a charger and a battery. So at the end of it all, it's like a $60 flash with a $30 battery, a free $10 charger, and stuff like that. All right, guys. Unfortunately, they don't. Um, I wish they did, and I wish um, because um, you know the internal resistance. Some of the I think these are like 2,500 uh, or 2,500. Uh, what you might call it? Same. Hmm? Yeah, milliamps, which is the same amount of battery power as our camera batteries and stuff like that. They don't, uh, but I can tell you, like, I've had a significant usage difference with these. Uh, mostly, um, I know it sounds silly, but if you guys are ever out there shooting mostly a wedding, it's like loading a shotgun during a horror movie or a zombie attack when you have all these double A's that fall out and you have to put two of them in one direction and two of them in the other. And so this is like having, like, I don't know, an assault rifle. You just slide the cartridge in and you're ready. And so that, it's just massively different. So, oh, all right, guys. Uh, did that answer your question concerning batteries? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, perfect. There Was are external battery packs. Yep. You get to the cam and flashes that do plug directly into them now. Mm -hmm. So, like, if you are shooting maintenance, you can connect the battery pack to the basket. So, you can see that they aren't, you have to put them on your belt extra cable and whatnot, but it is out there available. Yeah, the, uh, for Canon, it's the CPE4. For Nikons, I don't remember exactly what, but they go right to the front. And they do help, and uh, I don't think the SB910 does it, but anyone have the old SB800s? Yeah. There was that extra fifth clip that you can put on. I don't really think it did much, but, you know, it does, yeah, so. Yeah. Okay, so. Those, those, by the way, are old. I honestly think the SBA. I think the SB800 was the best flash I was ever made. So, yeah, like uh, I was, uh, I was extremely envious of the uh, what the SB800 could do and all that. Um, yeah. All right, guys. So more of the anatomy of speed lights, the, uh, which is now the back controls. There are a variety of controls that you'll see on the back of a flash. More than likely, there'll be buttons in some form of display. What's really important, guys, is that you actually the display makes sense to you. Uh, some of them have an LED in the back. Some of them just actually have little lights but uh the ones i tend to avoid are the ones that have scales i don't know if you've seen it like uh luma pro used to have it but uh the flashes that you buy mostly the manual ones and they're like if you put this color on i think the vivitar 285 is like if you put this color combination this is what you're gonna get i'm like what the heck is this um i prefer the reason why i like the uh the tt850 uh, this sounds terrible is it's like game boy mode it's just big you know, it's it's nothing fancy. It doesn't it doesn't show like uh, little small and use. It just shows what your power is, what your zoom is, and there you go. You know, uh, I can see this. You know, if I'm at a wedding, it's up. It works. So this is one of the other preferences I have. Not a complicated menu, um, which you can see the difference between uh, you know the scale over there, and that's a uh, that, that's with the LED just fully on on this flash. And so you want flash. 
that's comfortable to work with. Because the other thing too that I like to tell people is flash photography is amazing. This is under the uh, a slide that I have later. But something I've noticed mostly working one-on-one -on -one with people is the disconnect that a model or a client will have with someone when all of a sudden they're just fidgeting with their equipment and not paying attention to them. The cool thing about this, I know it sounds like this is a love story with this one, guys, but it kind of is. If I go up to it and I roll this wheel, it goes up and down in power. It does. There's no buttons you have to press. You just go to it, and you go up and down in power, and it does it. And so I'll show it to you. So it goes from a makes no sense to me. You can turn it completely off to whatever power you want, and all you do is just roll the wheel. And so I go up there, I'm talking to them, and I was like, all right, I need twice the power. I just go up one full stop, and there's really nothing complicated about it. Mm -hmm. Any questions, guys? Or This one is the TT850, but this is the newer that, that I don't suggest anymore. Um, so I suggest uh, you can look up TT850 newer and go to Amazon. It might give you the alternate suggestions. I'll look up the Cheetah version. The Cheetah version is going to be better. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, if you buy from Amazon, use our Amazon link, and uh, the, all the money that we get from that goes directly to Meet and Shoot. So, all right, guys. All right, the anatomy of speed, uh, speed light. Zooming in. This is where you guys might learn something new. Uh, some of you guys already know this. Flashes can reposition their focal spread so it either spreads wider or zooms in. Uh, it is condensing light, guys. So if I zoom in this flash, this is 24, and it's a wide, wide berth. And if I go to 105, it's a lot more centralized. Does anyone here shoot birds or so on? Anything like sports related or so forth? If you do, there's actually a device. I forgot what it's called, but it actually focuses your beam, so it's a 200 millimeter beam. Exactly. And so it really focuses the beam. The benefit of this, guys, is if your subject's here, do you need a light here if you're not going to get it? No, it concentrates your beam in. Something that I want you to, guys, to you know, um, take note about in flash photography is battery con conservation is important and performance. If all of a sudden you're, uh, you know, you're at 24 and you're flashing wide and your subject's only in the center, if you put it at 100, it's condensing the light, it's hitting the center, and you don't need as strong of a power to light your flash. And so all of a sudden, you're at full power to light the subject at 24, and then you're at one fourth power when you're at 105. Why that's relevant is now your flash refreshes eight times faster. And so those are some of the things that we do um, when we do like wedding photography or so on. Uh, with these units, something I'll go ahead and tell you guys is wedding photographers, we'd use ISO 1000, 1250, 1600 without a worry in the world. The reason why we do it is a lot of you guys may think, oh, ISO 100, great clear shots, I have a flash. Well, as soon as you go to ISO 1600, your flash needs 16 times less power to be used. And so your flash is 16 times faster, let's say just generally. And so if you're wondering how do we get 900 shots per battery, 1,000 shots per battery, it's because we don't need half power flashes, we need one 128 power. One one thirty second. Chris, you do the same as me. I, uh, I just got seven lights out of the five batteries that I um, SD eight hundred mm -hmm. this past week. So I shoot it uh, at like F four ISO sixteen hundred and like one thirty second of the flash. And so for performance and all that with speed light guys, what I want you to take out of it is we would be hard pressed to see the difference between an ISO eight hundred to sixteen hundred shot. We probably wouldn't need what you know. We wouldn't need to print out those shots more than likely at you know 16 by 20 or you know 20 by 30, something large in size. If you, yeah. hmm, so I know oh, it's actually it's not as grainy as you would expect, but also too like our ISO 1600 is what ISO 200 was 10 years ago. Full frame camera, but also just in there's a lot of a. Mm -hmm. And and also the cool part about that too, uh, for those who 
um, or wondering why we, we would do that, is you're also matching ambience. We don't have a slide in it here, but one of the biggest faux pas that a person makes when they first get a, a flash is like, this is where all the light comes from. You don't want that mentality at all. A speed light or any light is supplemental to what the existing light is, unless you've determined that's the only light you want. So if you're shooting an event and you're at a venue hall and there's down lighting or there's up lighting everywhere, you want to capture that. If you think your flash is the only light providing light, then you don't get any of all of that. You want that flash to just go ahead and complement the light, light that there or light that's there or supplement it. And so that's, you know, it's important to go ahead and manage that about a flash. What I do want to show you guys here though is you guys may have noticed these before. Um, for anyone who doesn't know what this does, this is actually a diffuser that spreads the beam even further. If I go to, uh, and sorry for anyone online, uh, I didn't connect my camera, I'll connect it a little bit later, but we're talking about the plastic diffuser on top. The maximum that I can go down, or the minimum I can go down is 24, uh, 24 on the back of the uh, flash. You guys see that there? Which means I have a 24 millimeter wide zoom. As soon as I take, as soon as I take this guy out, and it's not gonna show it on this one, uh, but it will show it on my other one, it's considered a 14 millimeter zoom. The problem that I see a lot of people do, this is as an instructor, I don't think anyone, I don't know if anyone here does this yet, is they, well, as soon as you put this up, it kills your power dramatically. And so just be wary that this is actually not like a softening device. It's a diffuser that spreads the beam out. If you're shooting with someone you're outside and this go ahead and comes out, you're forcing your flash to shoot more powerfully to get more of a result and you're killing your power. And so just be, care be wary of that. And so something, uh, something to note even too is if it's even partially out, your camera is going to zoom to 24. Sorry, your flash is going to zoom to 24. So you want to lock it in. Um, if, uh, so once again, if it's even slightly out, just push it back, back in. Flash will say whatever zoom level it's at. Uh, for many of your flashes, if you guys want to turn it on, try it. If you move this up, it will go ahead and go down and say 14 on the back of it. Uh, the uh, the actual trans the trans or the uh, the one that you could see through, yep. So that one right there. And so if you turn your flash on and you go ahead and pull it up, you'll actually see the uh, the numbers change on the back. All right, so guys, just be uh, be wary of that. But also for any sports shooters, any like any bird shooters or so forth, there is a device. I don't remember what it's called. Um, it's like a flash scope of sort, but it forces a beam the light, and it also it's actually something like that. Yeah. But just yeah, just be careful about those because you know your flash gets hot, and if you're shooting 15 straight full power shots, it's gonna get hot. And it's a uh, the first few that they had really like it works, but they couldn't put vent holes on it, and so it was just baking the internals even more. But just be aware or be aware that you can zoom in that beam. All right. All right, so we're not going to necessarily talk about TTL, guys, but I want to introduce you guys to it. Uh, what is TTL and what is manual? Most flashes allow you to manually control the flash, add more power here, take it away. TTL is part of an automatic metering that tries to analyze the scene and then adjust your flash power for you. What TTL stands for is through the lens. What happens is your flash pulses out a light right before it flashes. Uh, if anyone wants to know what it does exactly is it puts out a flash at 1 32nd the power. It analyzes the scene real quick and say, okay, this is what the power should be. Quickly adjust your flash to that power and then takes a picture. This happens all within a quarter of a second, not even. It happens like instantaneously. The problem is going to paragraph two is you can use a flash to trigger a studio strobe that has slave mode on. Has anyone ever done that before? Yeah. It's a smart thing to do. The bad part is TTL actually has a pre-flash that goes off that will pop your flash off, and by the time your flash goes off, your studio light's done. And so it actually, you don't see a result. So if you're using, you're MacGyvering it, you forgot your studio triggers at home, and you take your flash out, or you pop up your flash on your personal camera, put it on manual, or it's not gonna trigger your studio strobe, unless it's one of the newer strobes that have a smart mode on it that detects the TTL pre-flash. And so that's the main thing I want to note there because something that's really cool is I'm going to go ahead and
pimp this one out again, but a lot of flashes do it. Let's say my batteries are running out on my triggers. I don't have a, I don't have a receiver for this one, but I have a receiver for my main flash. So I go to mode on this and I choose S1. And the reason why I choose S1 is now it's actively looking for a pulse of flash. So I turn this guy on. So that's one thirty second power. I'm triggering this flash with this flash, but if this was a TTL one, this one will go off on the first one. But now if I put S2, mode S2, it's actually waiting for the TTL signal, and then it's gonna pop when my flash goes off. So this little unit right here, and a lot of the units now that are out, not only will it work if you put a receiver on it, but if you're the only one shooting, you haven't bought a lot of wireless receivers yet, you can put it on S1 and S2, and it's going to detect another flash and go off. So it's pretty useful, guys. Mostly if you're building your, your set, you have a limited budget, you can't buy another receiver yet, you can still buy one of these and use it immediately if your other flashes will trigger it. So once again, if I hit that, I'm oh, sorry, um, you make sure it's, it's on. Yep. Oh, shoot. There you go. I was covering the phone. So it's triggering uh, by detecting the, uh, the flash that's going on. All right, guys. Um, concerning TTL, we're not going to cover it today, but TTL has some great benefits. Um, essentially, you guys may have heard, it's, a, it's, it's not new. I mean, TTL has been out for ages. But has anyone seen the, uh, oh, what is that extremely, absurdly expensive pro photo? Uh, the new pro photo battery powered flash where they're like, it's TTL base. Essentially, you have a transmitter, it does basic TTL and it does your exposure for you and it gives it to you. I hate saying this, guys. I'm not one of those guys who are like manual only, but when it comes to studio lights, I hate the idea of if you set up a studio light here that you're it's randomly giving you whatever setting it thinks it is. I've always been in the market. It's there. And as long as your subject's there, don't worry about it. And don't worry about this numbers that's changing every time you hit a flash. So. <laughs> it's handy. <laughs> well, we'll say this. Something that's really cool about the TTL systems, and for anyone who's interested, is not only do you have automatic systems, but you can also manually control those flashes from your camera. And so for anyone, has anyone heard of the Canon's radio system, the RP system? You can go full, but you can go put a flash up there and say, okay, that flash, which I'm gonna designate as a C flash, so it's in group C, I want you guys all now to be at one eighth power. And you can do that right at your master unit. And so it's still shooting manual, and you're giving it manual control but instead of going up to it, which it might be in a raptor or it might be something, you can go ahead and adjust the control. Yep. And so, but the re reason I like the Canon one is it actually is a, uh, it's a full feedback system. And so that flash is going to actually communicate back to you and tell you what its powers are. And so I'm not going to really necessarily win over anyone on this because I have no reason why it would have won, won me over. But it's a really interesting system on Canon's side because now, all of their flashes, I'm telling you this so you guys can mess with someone at a wedding. You can go to their flash and hit a certain menu and trigger their camera. And so I didn't tell you that, but you can. Uh, if you go to the first menu, there's an option to trigger the main camera with the flash. And so that flash will actually send a trigger signal to the camera. Why is that useful? Because if anyone has ever seen like a Greyhound race or something like that, if a guy's out here shooting, you could actually hit a switch and all the cameras that he has set up will shoot every time he shoots. And so it's pretty neat. And so, yep. So it's, it's pretty neat mostly when you, have, uh, when you have all of that. All right, guys. So why use it off camera? Light moves in a three-dimensional space around your subject. Um, and on opposite side of where light hits is a shadow. Uh, for anyone who's taking classes from me, you guys know I repeat that religiously. Um, and so using Aaron right here, this is not a strobe. The problem with the flash is when you're directly on them, you're on camera access, 
the light's hitting your subject completely. You guys can see that with me, right? So there's a little bit of shadow detail there. Might not be much, but as I go further up, there's a little bit more shadow detail. Where depth and dimension is created by shadows that fall upon us. So on your subject, if you're able to move the light around, you can really, really manipulate the feel, the drama on your photos by being able to move the light around your subject. So that's why we do what we do with studio lights, with a support. The reason why I love it with speed lights is you have portability there and also affordability. You can easily start, or you can easily get one of these speed lights for six minutes and start moving the light off camera. All right, so. This creates atmosphere, drama, and a different feel. A speed light is a quick and easy way to start this. Something I don't like about this image that I pulled online is obviously the picture on the right uses more than one light. But uh, you get to see kind of like what it does. Because immediately, first picture is like this. And then you get more shadow depth and so forth by moving the camera or moving the main light just about right here. And so that's one of the things that you can do with a, a uh, off-camera flash. All right, any questions, guys, before we go on? Make sense to everyone? All right, so a little bit more with that, um, triggering solutions. This is where we're going to go ahead and get a little bit more technical, but hopefully answer some questions for you guys. Uh, when you get an off-camera flash, uh, there's a couple ways to trigger it, with a cable, without a cable. Um, with the cable is the easiest way to do it. Um, essentially, you have a long cable. Uh, there's various ways that go directly to the flash and go directly to your camera. The benefit of a cable, for anyone who's interested with it, is you can do ETTL over a cable for a very affordable price. To do ETTL over a wireless trigger system, which we'll talk about in a little bit, you'll start your basic, you know, your basic cost to play is about $200. Uh, but if you get a 30 or a 30 meter cable, you can buy one for 40 bucks and it has the same ETTL information that can go through it, which is extremely useful because ETTL other perks that are really nice with it. Once again, we talked that you can manually control power. If I go to my Canon and I have a flash directly connected to a cable or a TTL trigger, I can look at my the back of my Canon and say, okay, make this flash more powerful. Make this flash less powerful. So instead of having to go to the light, I can go ahead and trigger it. So imagine not having to tell your assistant or your, you know, your daughter or your, you know, uncle, hey, Mess with this button and change the power for me. You could do it yourself. Something else that's important, and this is really critical, but we're not going to talk about it, is something called F-Sync and high-speed sync. High-speed sync is a proprietary thing from your company um, that essentially, when you use a flash, if you go over a certain sync speed, your camera is going to register a black bar. And that's your shutter opening and closing and the light hitting the and hitting the bar. Has everyone seen that? If you're using a studio strobe? So what high speed sync is on Canon is when that shutter opens, instead of one pulse of light, it rolls the light. It pulses it repeatedly. And because of that, as the curtain opens, light here, light here, light here, and you can break that one, one or one two hundredth barrier. You can break that, you can go up to one one thousandth, you can go to one eight thousandth of a second. But the problem is, also that flash is that much weaker. So the um, reason why this is relevant to you is if you use wireless triggers, dummy wireless triggers that are not uh, the more expensive ones, you can't do high-speed sync. You're limited to your sync speed. If you go over your sync speed, you'll get a black bar. That's how it works. But if you use a TTL cable, or if you use a, um, a wireless uh, trigger system that's capable of doing high-speed sync, well, you can jack your camera up to one two thousandths of a second, one four thousandths. And that's actually really useful because now you can use a flash outside with your 1.4 lens shooting at ISO 100 during midday sun. And so it's really useful because if you try shooting at 1.4 during a sunny day, you're at one eight thousandths of a second. You're at one you know, four thousandths if you're in the shade. But now you can actually go ahead and use a flash outside and still be within, be within that. So is it useful? I would actually say for a lot of you guys, a nice redundancy to have, mostly if you're shooting with a lot of strobes outside, go ahead and buy your TTL cable. Buy yourself a long one and just put 
put it somewhere in the back of your car. I'm a big redundancy fan. Shooting weddings, we can't ever tell a client, hey, I'm sorry, my camera's dead. You can't shoot your wedding. You know, that doesn't happen, right, Chris? And so do we have more than we need? Yes, because that's what we have to do. And so a TTL cable is one way to do it. You can trigger your flash. You have your automatic settings. You have TTL, and you can go ahead and uh, trigger it remotely. All right, so on the other side, you have a wireless solution, which we'll go to the next one. Uh-huh. As whether or not the flash unit can do high speed. Yep. Some of the cheaper lower end models can't do high speed sync because they don't have the right mode or whatever it is yep. to support that. Yep, high speed sync and also uh, high speed sync is something that third party companies, mostly from China, have been trying to reverse engineer. Like uh, they've been going crazy with. Good job, Chris. So um, I'm sorry, bye. <laughs> um, you know, and so some implementation implementations of high speed sync doesn't work well. Some uh, some do. Uh, does, has anyone ever used a studio strobe outside? I'm going to give you a strange, re weird hint here. Uh, for those who don't know, the way a studio strobe works is um, it doesn't put out more. Or, sorry, it doesn't put out more intensity of light. But when you use a studio strobe, instead of putting out light over, say, like one eight thousandth of a second. If you put the power up, and now it puts out that same amount of light longer. So instead of putting a quick one eight thousandths, it puts out light at one one thousandths of a second. So for a lot longer window, it's open. So here's something neat with you guys. If anyone wants to try it out, if you put your flash, your studio strobe outside at the highest power possible, you could try high speed sync with your studio strobe without high speed sync equipment. Because now you're forcing your studio strobe to put out as much light as possible over a long period of time and you're hoping to catch that light within that period. And so why this is relevant is the cheaper your studio strobe, the more likely it's going to work because the longer your studio strobe. And it's really neat because all of a sudden now you can shoot one eight thousand at 2.0 with a studio light. Is it guaranteed to work? No. But you could experiment with it with anyone who has a studio strobe here because of how that works. All right, guys. So let's go to wireless options. There are an incredible amount of wireless triggering options. Uh, it's, at its most basic, you can roughly spend 40 bucks and get a transmitter and receiver that will fire your flash. This is where I'm going to go ahead and mention one that I use exclusively. Uh, Chris has used it before. I don't know if you still use these, Chris, the Photix. All right, guys, the only reason I love these is this is kind of dumb. Is here's the transmitter and here's the receiver. Uh, so I put this, let me go ahead and make sure this goes on. I put this on a flash for anyone online. Uh, it's, a, it's a unit that you see up there. So. Turn this one on. Did I run out of battery power? Yes, I did. Uh, battery's dead on this one. Let me see if I have a, another one because I left it on. Uh, triple A's, unfortunately. Normally runs anywhere between like 50 to 100 bucks just for the cable. So it's a pretty cool setup that can do a lot of different things. You can plug it in, fire alien bees with it. Uh, if you're all shooting somewhere, for example, I've used my camera by myself. I'm not leaving the camera up in the balcony. I'll be down below every time I fire. I'm triggering my camera using it. So it just gives you a lot of versatility. I think I killed both my batteries. I just left them on, but uh, all right, guys, the reason why I use these triggers is they're basic dummy triggers. There's nothing special about them, but the transmitter on top actually has a, uh, if you guys notice the, the one that says transmitter right there, it doesn't have just one center prong. Let me make sure this works. It actually has the uh, prongs that you need to go ahead and communicate with your, your automatic flash. And so I'll show you guys that in just a second. Let me make sure this works. All right. So here I have a transmitter. And it fires my flash manually, right? On the top of the transmitter is the five prongs needed for my Canon system. This is where it's killer. It actually passes the automatic info through the transmitter, just goes right through to the flash I have on top. 
This sends out a dummy signal to go ahead and fire that flash remotely, just whatever power it's at. But now I have a flash on top that's fully automatic that I'm still shooting with. This is one of the best things possible for a wedding shooter because now I have this flash on my camera on top like that. And I'm fully automatic as I shoot a wedding. And I have all these satellite flashes behind me as much as I want, just firing every time this one fires off while I still have automatic uh, metering and automatic TTL with this flash. And that's the only benefit why this flash trigger is more important to me than all the other ones I have. Uh, you guys have heard Pocket Wizards. They released a great solution, kind of great, but their unit that you put on top will actually um, are intercepts the signal and will not, you can't uh, fire the strobe or you can't turn the unit off and fire your strobe and have it work correctly. This unit, you turn it off, it, the pass through just goes through. You turn it on, it's working. It does nothing to impede the flash that's on top of your camera. Uh, other units like um, the can Mm -hmm. Yep. I don't know. Uh, I haven't. Yeah, I haven't tried it yet. But uh, I'll go ahead and say with this one, uh, what I do love about it is it. You know, it takes up no space. For anyone who's over there flashes that correctly. And um, for anyone who doesn't necessarily know about like flash systems yet, I can put that flash right there on. I can put it on B, C, or D. And so if I put this unit on D, right here. Go ahead and put it on D there. Right now it's popping because D's lit, but if I take D off right here, it's not gonna pop. So I can immediately say, I don't want these flashes in the shot. And it'll take it off completely. And then there's a bunch of channels too, so if anyone has the same unit, you can go ahead and jump to whatever channel you want. But it's pretty useful, it's really quick and easy and allows you to adjust your flash as needed. And so it's really killer, mostly for anyone who's trying to like uh, isolate their flashes and setting it up in studio, you can say, all right, this studio lights B, this one's C, D, and stuff like that. And so, mm -hmm. I was going to say, that's like a lot. Two or three flashes, one on top of my camera, one in each corner. During a first dance, if my flash is maybe two minutes, I can go through four different lighting scenarios. It's just a quick switch to one. I just can use my nose on them when I yep. them before, just to hit it quickly really fast and keep it high. So, if you like four different lights, Yep. And like any other tool, you get more experience as you use them. Uh, I'm a big Canon guy. Uh, like I love the Canon new RT system that came out two years ago. I think it's amazing. But to enter to play three lights, one transmitter, that's I don't know if you guys have done the math. That's about seventeen hundred bucks. No, actually, with tax about nineteen fifty. Five uh, five forty nine per flash plus a transmitter. To get three receivers, three flashes, mostly that I'm going to use dummy wise, it's sub five hundred dollars when you go when you do it this way. And so for a lot of us, like the Canon system is great and all. I tried it, but every time I looked, that I had to spend five hundred forty dollars get the next flash in to have the convenience of putting it on manual. That's why I went to this system. But uh, wireless option, guys. Is there any questions that you guys have? Mm -hmm. I know oh, it's actually uh, you want to buy it specifically uh, for whatever camera because your pass through is going to look, you know, your pass through is going to look Nikon, I believe, is four, you know, or, and then Canon is one dot and then four on the bottom. Uh, the cool thing though is they are dummy triggers. So if I give you guys this trigger, uh, if the Canon one and you put it on your Nikon, it will still remotely fire all the flash. It just will not fire your flash automatically if you have one on top. Yeah, the uh, I believe that one does work with CLS. So, because uh, yeah, it's it literally is a dummy pass through. Does not interfere with any signal. Does not do anything other than pass the signal through. I mean, at its most basic, guys, you guys can see probably why I like it. It works. It does what it's supposed to, but it allows me the luxury of my own system or dealing with whatever. Uh, the funny part too is like um, this seems like really silly, but if you guys have a set of these and you have another set of triggers, you put this on your camera, let me see here. If you ever run out of uh, transmitters, this has actually happened for a meet and shoot. You put your other transmitter on top 
and it'll fire every receiver that you have of this unit and this unit. And so um, I know it seems really weird with that, but we've had to do it before. Like you put a cyber sync on top, a pocket wizard. I know it seems weird, but it will do it. And so um, it's just, it's the fact that it has a pass through that makes, that makes it work for me. And then on this end, what I like about this is there's a dummy thread on the bottom on the receiver. And so that leads into the next slide, which is the setup. You're setting up a studio, or when you're setting up portably, uh, guys, if you're at your most basic, um, the reason why I like this receiver is on the bottom is a thread. You just go ahead and thread it in, and your flash is ready. There you go. I want to admit something that is completely stupid and I didn't realize. Who here has a uh, Canon um, 600 or 580? Is anyone here? There's a thread on the side. That's a tripod mount. You just screw it on top of your flat. I've never known that. Also yeah. Yep. Yeah, there's, yeah, on the side of your Canon, on your, or your high end one, if you're ever in an emergency, just screw your light stand into it. That's what it's designed for. I never knew that. It doesn't include the other four cannon shooters. It takes to screw it in. <laughs> yeah, tell me about it. I, I'll admit, I'll admit my mistake, but like, uh, yeah, guys, if you have a, uh, <laughs> if you have a 600 EX or a 580 here, just look on the side. That's what that dummy empty, uh, empty silver slot is for. It's just a, it's a tripod mount, and so. Yep. And perfect there. Yeah, the the tripod foot, or, or sorry, the uh, the hot shoe foot. I had one somewhere. I'm trying to look for where I left it. Uh, it's probably in my other in my other pants. Yes, it is. Did I bring it? Yep. The uh, the hot shoe flat or the uh, the mount that comes with the foot comes with one stuff like that too. So guys, here's a, here's a most basic is a unit that I put on I put on a stand. Uh, the problem is the articulating head will go up. But not down, and so we're kind of uh, we're kind of caught in the corner there. But immediately, I'm going ahead and just using it right then. And so here's a flash; it works. Something that everyone should try to purchase is just one of these guys, which is a umbrella uh, uh, umbrella converter for a flash. It's what if you guys do an Amazon search it's an umbrella converter? Because um, the main thing is it's not that it just holds a flash. It also has a port for you to put an umbrella through, and that's the uh, that's the relevant part about it. Trying to find, it's one of those things, guys. If anyone doesn't know how to like Google search well, don't search for super obvious like super obvious things. If you look for flash holder, you're probably, you're going to get a shit ton more results. Excuse the language over umbrella converter, and so it's one of those things. So uh, if mm -hmm. that that one does. Yeah, that one does too. So right there. So, um, mm -hmm. this one is a, um, this one right here is a unit from, I'm trying to remember, oh, this one's a cowboy studio ones. It works. And so essentially, the reason why you get this, you just leave it on your uh, stand if you want to. And then now this clips in your hot shoe. Let me go ahead and lock that down. Anyone online, I apologize. Once again, I haven't put my camera on, but uh, we'll put one on for uh, when we're shooting it in real time at the end. So essentially, now that I locked this one in, guys, uh, you want to you wanna be careful about how you lock it in um, because it is a feisty system. So... I agree. Because there's a there's a couple of more that are a little bit better and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah actually, I think uh, it's this guy right here. This little has anyone not seen one of these before? I mean, you guys have mostly all seen them because I can pass this around if you guys want to see it. So, um, all right, so guys, 
taking it off camera, we have a wireless trigger solution. We have a flash. You guys see it there, right? And so now we have an articulating head that goes up and down here, but we also have this guy that goes up and down there. And so you have the movability that you want, and you get it there. A super clamp, which is really useful. I didn't bring one. I had one packed, but I forgot to bring it. Is these guys are univer they universally go on anything here. So if you're right by a tree and you don't want to set up a light stand, you clamp the super clamp to it and you put this right on it and you put your flash on it. Super clamps are extremely useful because you're doing a quick headshot of somebody and there's a really ornate door. Uh, use the door as a background. I know it sounds really weird. Get a super clamp, clamp it to the top, put this on top, and all of a sudden you have a hair light that goes right behind them. These are the you know the little things that you can do with a super clamp and using one of these lights. Um, here's a really useful one for anyone who uh, hasn't done this before. You use this as a light on your subject, right? Some people have done this before. You take a super clamp and you put it right here. You use the same stand, and it's now a background light. And so those are the things that you can do to go ahead and just optimize the uh, optimize your studio usage and so on. Because the more stands you put the larger footprint that you have being taken by equipment and the more annoying it is to work in that environment. So I use super clamps almost religiously when it comes to studio setups at, uh, at the corporate events and so forth because it's less liability when you have less things hanging around. And also they don't give you the space we need. They kind of actually, you know, corporations give you a lot less to work with. And so super clamping all the stuff to one stand really, 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 uh, really helps. All right, guys. Any questions concerning setup? Anyone have any, any encounter any issues or anything you want to note to others so they don't make the same mistakes we've made, possibly made in the past? Chris? Use the sandbag. They, uh, even though they're light and small, they're especially recycling modifiers on the mm -hmm. left and your subject or to uh, send your flash in for repair. It'll cost you about $115. Yep, it actually costs you more than uh, some of the flashes are now. So, yep. Uh, so super clamp guy, we'll cover a little bit more. All right, that leads into this one, guys. Uh, a little bit more about it. Making your light source bigger is one of the best things that you can do. That's it. Modifying, we'll talk about it a little bit. But when we teach our lighting class, there's two concepts that I really push. We break it down to the most basic level. I want to go ahead and reiterate. Opposite side of where light hits is what, guys? Shadow. The reason why there's a shadow is around your subject, your light moves in a three-dimensional space. So you move your light around. The next one is the bigger your light source, the softer the shadows. You want to write that down for anyone who's never heard me say that before? Write it down. It's one of those things that you just want to know. Bigger your light source, the softer the shadows. All right, so when you work with a splash, it's tiny. It's small. Uh, it's a small light source. I'm going to go ahead and show you guys with my phone online. I apologize. Our streaming, I'll go ahead and try to show you guys a little bit later. The smaller your light source, the more well-defined the shadows are. That's how it works. And so if I go to a bigger light source, slightly bigger, it's going to be a quick and harsh to see. You guys can still see it. It's a small light source. If I zoom this up, all right, if I make this more powerful, then I put it by this wall, and what, what I'm doing is bouncing it off this wall. It's intercepting the wall, and then now it's gonna be that big, and then it's gonna broadcast to my hand. It's a giant light source. So I do that. Look at my hand again, guys, one second. The shadow should be roughly over there somewhere. I mean, you may have seen it. I don't know if you guys saw it or not, it's so fast. It's a lot softer, and I'll go ahead and try it. I, normally, I would have a light on there, but essentially, guys, the bigger your light source, the softer the shadows. So you want to remember that. Why that's relevant to you is when you move this flash, if you don't have an umbrella yet to enlarge your light source, move it back here, let's say, to this corner, and move it up, and you trigger it. That whole wall becomes your light source. And so now you can quickly shoot. You can stand right here and shoot. You have this giant light that's on your subject. And that's how you can quickly do it. So you've raised the light a little bit above you, and you have this beautiful soft light on your subject. And that's by moving your light off camera 
and also repositioning it so you create a bigger light source. And this image here, you can see it. You guys see what I'm doing with that little flash that I have right there? That's all it is. Instead of pointing the flash directly to my subject, I'm pointing it to a unit that's intercepting it and creating a bigger light source and then bouncing it back. Where this is relevant to you is um, something else is like, or sorry, the bigger the light source, the softer the shadows, but also the closer your light source is to your subject, the bigger it is. So why this is relevant is now, if, I, if I'm limited, let's say, you know, I have to set up something fairly quick. I have to do a macro shot at a wedding, right? I can't set that up because I don't have the time to set up that flash or that softbox unit. Uh, I'm trying to figure out if there is a, can I have a sheet of paper, somebody? Anyone have an extra or just a spare sheet of paper that I can steal real, real quick? Thank you, sir. And so the bigger your light source, the softer your shadows, but the closer you are to your subject, the bigger the light source is. So you have to set up a macro shot. I set this up real quick. I put it down here. I put this right above it and I hit the trigger. That becomes my light source. You guys see how bigger, much bigger that is. So if I have the ring right here, this becomes as big as a cloud because you're right by your, uh, you're right by your subject. So I'm gonna go ahead and put that down again. And uh, once again, I'm gonna go ahead and tilt this down. We have, you know, we have the ring right here. And so we have this as the, you have this as your soft box and it's intercepting. And now this beautiful soft light is hitting your subject. You guys see like how the light is on there. And so that's the general idea there. You're making your light source bigger. And so in a way guys, if you're doing, taking an up close shot, this isn't a giant little thing, this little white car that comes up. But if your flash is right by your subject, it makes a world of difference. Or the other thing too is I use what's called the DEM flip it, D-E-M-B, flip it. And it's just a white card that is, you know, articulates back but flips up if you ever need to use it. And so um, you guys have probably seen like Gary Fong light sphere or stuff like that. I don't really use those at events because they're bulky. Uh, and they also fall off and I'm walking around. And so I tend to use a flip it, which just is right on the camera itself. Essentially, I didn't bring mine because I lost it somewhere. But it's a, um, and I haven't shot a wedding. I this weekend. It's, it has a black tab, and when you use it, you just flip it up. And it, it's a hard piece of like uh, plastic, and so it works really well. And it intercepts there. All right, guys. Any questions on making your light source bigger? This is one of those things that you really, really, really want to do. Um, for anyone who. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, actually, uh, using those tools, and something I'll go ahead and say with that, Rodney, is whatever means, you know this one, whatever means you use to get your whatever's there, doesn't matter because that's not what you're photographing. You're just photographing your subject. So use whatever means necessary, including a friend who's six foot seven wearing a white T-shirt standing right by your subject. It works because you're not taking a picture of your friend who's six foot seven. You're taking a picture of your subject. And so using white cards, using bounce cards, using everything there, um, using a wall at the studio. Hey guys, it's the last 15 minutes I have at Photoplex, but you look amazing. I didn't realize that, you know, after your makeup, you have a slightly different look, set up your studio light or actually you don't even have to do it. You take your camera out, you go up to the wall and you face it right at there, you create a bigger light source. As soon as you create a bigger light source, you have a soft box. And so you position your subject right here in the corner here. There's a white wall behind them. You bounce the light here. All of a sudden it looks exactly like the seven foot box that they have back there. Because you're using this giant wall to reflect the light back onto your subject. And so that's how you quickly make a small flash big. The problem about making a small flash big though is you lose power dramatically. If you're wondering, like, wow, wow, this flash can do everything that a studio strobe can, well, if you the bigger you make your light source, the more dramatic the power decrease is. Well, those studio strobes are putting about 64 times, 80 times the power that this flash is putting out. That means you can use a bigger modifier or you can shoot at f16. You can shoot at f13, stuff like that. 
And so there is a reason why to have all of them. All right, guys, so let's talk a little bit about modifiers. Uh, before that, you guys want to take a break? We've been told before that sometimes these sessions people should take breaks. Are you guys good? Most everyone here is good. All right, guys. Uh, there are a great amount of modifiers for speed lights or even companies who have made a killing making these modifiers for them. Uh, Honel, H-O-N-L, makes amazing uh, speed light modifiers. If anyone wants to stick with a system and stick with a uh, company that creates great ones, Rogue is a really good one, R-O-G-U-E. -G uh, Honel, we don't even use any of them, right? So. Uh, I've got a Honel uh, little uh, grid unit that just Velcros to the flash. It's yeah. like 25 bucks. Works really well. Um, huh? Sometimes, like if I'm trying to do like some creative portraits with the speed light, I use one as my main light, maybe in the salt box, and then use the grid, possibly with a gel in it to create a really cool background light or something. Uh, I have a favorite that I haven't bought yet, but I think is really neat. I don't know if you guys have heard it. Magmod uh, is going to be a really neat one, and they have a converter that goes on front of your flash, whatever your flash is, and there's two neodymium magnets on it that doesn't affect your performance. And all their modifiers are just magnet click. And you just put, and so you quickly take off the one you want and put the one you want on. And so that went through Kickstarter about two years ago. And I think it's now readily available. But I think that's a really cool one because it has gels, it has all of that, snoots, and it's all magnet click. And so, and the neodymium magnets are really strong. So uh, they work really well. All right. So let's talk about modifiers, guys. Um, Here's the thing, uh, we talk about it, but feel free to ask what they do, give suggestions. At the end, we actually put it all together and show you. That's when I put the camera back on for online. And so not only are we talking about it, but later we're gonna exclude and show you the different modifiers working. So there is a hands-on part. Uh, is there any questions that you guys have about modifiers like before we jump into talking about them? Anyone have any? Uh... Nope, maybe I'll have Mm -hmm. This is more of an advanced question, but I'm going to answer it, Rodney, because uh, I love this question. A beauty dish. Have you guys seen it before? Um, a beauty dish, the main difference, guys, is it creates a specular, uh, specular light. So if your subject has horrible skin like me, it makes it look worse because it's going to create a harsher contrast and also more, uh, more highlights, where softbox has a finer, uh, or sorry, has a more softer gradient when it comes to it. Uh, so if you're shooting a subject and she wants to look beautiful and she's 55 and she hasn't done her like skin treatments and she wants, you know, she's hiring you, put a soft box on her. You know, if you're shooting a 17 year old girl who wants to be, you know, her has great skin and she wants to emulate a, um, you know, a shoot, a fashion shoot that she's seen in a magazine and she has poor skin, the contrast coming off a of beauty dish is perfect for her. And so it's one of those things. That's the that's the main difference. So you do. Yep, it's, it varies to your sub. If you put that beauty dish on me, I won't buy the picture, even though it's a beauty dish, because I'm looking at myself. Why did you make me look worse than I know I look, even though I look exactly like that? You know, because which leads to something. I tell this to a couple of my students and so on. It seems silly saying this. This is kind of me ranting. We're in a vain industry, guys. I never forget that. Our job is to make people look good. And so those things, knowing the difference between what a beauty dish and a softbox will do is critical to our success. You know, um, and so it's one of those things where, where someone may stand out over another person is they know, okay, I'm opening Pandora's box if I use this. If I use a smaller light source on this subject that has more skin, I'm going to show every detail and every crevasse on the face. Comparatively, if I use this large softbox over here, which just smooths everything out. That right there could be instant Photoshop for you guys using a bigger light source. So, if you didn't, if you didn't have a soft light, mm -hmm. you, you could take a, a cup of uh, cheese or whatever. You lose a lot of power and stuff like that. There's a for anyone who's interested and who wants to work with it, making your light source bigger is really the thing that creates softer shadows. And so, if you have like a if you have a little light, like let's say this paper right here, if you have a flashlight and you put this piece of paper in front of it, this becomes the size of your light source. It's really useful. So one of the easiest things to do if you want to build your own stuff or so on is buy ripstop nylon from Joe Ant, so on. $2.99 for a square yard. 
or not even square yard. I think it's six by three or something like that. And it's the same material that goes to the softbox. And so if anyone ever messes or accidentally rips up your uh, softbox and rips up the front, just go buy ripstop nylon. It's the same exact material and you just rebuild it. Or if anyone wants to save money and it's a sunny day and it's really sunny and it's going to be sunny, you live in Arizona and it's just pure sunlight for the next five days, buy a PVC frame and build, and uh, go ahead and buy some ripstop nylon and intercept that sun and make it a bigger light source. Because the sun is a small light source when it comes and hits your subject. It's well-defined, you get harsh shadows. You hold that ripstop nylon and you hold that, uh, that right there, all the way to the light source, you get this beautiful shadow on your subject. Same thing with this. If you build one of those, anyone who's kind of a MacGyverish at it, um, you buy one of these lights, you buy, a, um, you buy a couple PVC pipes, you can build your own softbox and build it to whatever size or whatever shape you want. Because the cool part too is you get a square softbox and you put it on your subject, they have a square reflection. Well, you can make your own fun personal project and build whatever shape you want and make that a softbox. And there's your new portrait. A bunch of headshots with a symbol that that's your copyright. You know, there's an idea right there. I mean, it's a. Do you want to pick the right modifier for what you're shooting? You're doing creative portraits, then you might want to emulate what you do in a studio. Put in a quick, easy, cheap portrait. So if I normally use a softbox here, I might choose to have a little 16 by 16 like this as my main light. I might want to snoot for a hair light and then make the grid as my background light. That way I can create the same sort of tools and everything. My favorite speed light modifier is my little like $8 soften hat that goes over it. All yep. it that softens it, kind of like what a phone would do, but a smaller, lighter, and a lot cheaper. I aim it straight up and I cut off on what I can do ceilings 99% of the time. That's my go to speed light light. But if I want to get creative and go do some fun portraits or something, you can't beat a, beat a little salt box or you can't beat having the ability to create a or something. So it's really about what kind of flexibility do you need? Are you trying to do really cool creative lighting? Are you trying to do functional lighting? Something that's fast and lightweight? Or With the stuff, and you can always, after the process, use the Oh, absolutely. I mean, with, with the little stuff box, I mean, all this is a little, it's, if you haven't seen it, it just has over the front of your flash. It's just a slightly funny little soft plastic pulled down that goes over it. And all it does is it softens it when it comes out. Um, it's unlike the little flip down uh, prism unit, it's not going to change the, the zoom factor on your and help freeze it up a little bit. I can walk right up here somebody, pop the flash four feet from them, and I'm not going to get that real bright coat. Thank you. Thank you. you guys know pretty well where you're going to start generally. I mean, it costs you all of it. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, well, Trent might have a different answer. I think. Uh, you know, you could go sit for 14 hours listening to Hobby and the galley talk about all the different ways they light the flash. Uh, it's really just the same as your studio principles, you know, take your main light, that it in, and light through your different layers, add your, add your accent light, your kicker, your background light, your hair light, whatever else you need to add to the additions you want. Start simple, get your all black photo, add your main light, add your Life as your background, and you're done. So, so I think it's really deep in the center. exactly. I think it's more intimidating to work with these little bit of the units. It's like, oh, I can't even see what the output's going to be. What's it going to look like? And and you forget your principles. But your lighting principles don't change. Whether it's just the sun hitting a, a cement wall, your little speed light that you're bouncing through a small wall box, your studio light that you're putting through a, a big aqua box. It's all the same thing, and you're accomplishing the same purpose. Uh, the only thing I'll say when I start with photography is I don't start at my extremes. If I have a 1.4 lens, I don't shoot at 1.4. I start at 2 because then I can always go down to 2.8 or up to 1.4. I give myself that tolerance because if you start at your extremes, you're limiting yourself. 
And so why I say that is if I'm doing studio shooting or if I'm shooting outside, I'll go ahead and show you guys a picture. Uh, we're on slide 26. We shot with Aaron today at the lake. And uh, these are quick shots. This is my setup shot, my first shot with her. And I'm at F8, you know, F8 ISO 50. So I start, oh, sorry. Oh, one second. Right there. I apologize. So. <laughs> no, this is it. Yeah. It's the body art ball, though. And so, so these are ISO 50. Yes, I limited it to ISO 50 because I was trying to get the, uh, the sun there. But it's at F8. So if I wanted to adjust a little bit, I could go to 5.6. I could go to F11, which I believe I did later. Let me go in and make sure here. So make sure. I think... Uh, yeah, 7.1, so I'm adjusting there. Oh yeah, actually, this was just overcast skies today. This was all today at the lake about, uh, yeah. So this was at the lake four hours ago, so, yeah. So I'm trying to, f and the reason why I brought this in to show you guys is all of this was done today with this guy right here, which is one of the modifiers we're gonna talk to you about. There wasn't anything special. We did use a studio strobe, but it wasn't a studio strobe at full power because the light levels weren't really that bright. But uh, when we talk about these shots, these were all done using a, a Broly box and uh, just Joel and I shooting. But um, going back to it, uh, concerning how I start, this is 5.6 or so on. Yes, I have a 2.8 lens. Yes, I have a 1.2 lens, but I don't start at the extremes anymore. I can't go to the extremes if I want to. But to make my life easier, so I have tolerance, I started at f2 if I'm using, like, if I want to go for, you know, fast, I started at f2, um, which I do 1, 2, 1, 4. Or if I'm using my 2.8 lens, I start at 5, 6 to f8, and then I make it there as necessary. Mm-hmm. Yep, uh, and something also I took into uh, consideration is a long time ago is uh, your lens is at its sharpest two stops down from wide open. Is this the general consensus? And so at um, like my 50, I have a 51.2. If I go to 2.5, that's where it's sharpest. Technically, where it starts getting sharper. So the stuff like that is what I uh, what I try to do. Sure. Ask my them. Last, last night in the storm, I left my jacket down and got tore all the pieces. So now I've got a whole bunch of white nylon. Mm -hmm. um, how do I decide if that's good for a soft box? I was thinking it was really thin to see light all through. It's good for, for soft box, but the difference in materials uh, is how much light that it kills. And so the, you might find that the effects of it are good for a certain soft. Uh, you know, it might not be the best material possible, but. It's the you know, thing you want to do is try because there's a company. Um, God, I'm trying to remember the name, but um, does anyone remember that modifier that Ann Levowitz uses? I talk about it all the time. It's a Broly box. It's, it's a hundred dollar Broly boxes when Broly boxes cost fifty. But the main difference is the material is a little bit more space age, and so it's thinner, so it doesn't kill your light as much while doing the same results. Yeah. So if it's really thin, uh, it's one of those things. Just try it out, and. Um, just if you're building your own softbox, just be aware as you go to a certain size, you need another baffle within your softbox. If anyone ever opens the softbox and you see that you have your front portion and then all of a sudden you have your inner portion that has a lining on it, what happens is that inner portion absor or intercepts it and then it allows the light to go on the outside because it's weaker. That actually makes the light more uniform. So if you take out that uh, inner baffle, it gets really bright and center. And so if you're building a big softbox, try to Try to go ahead and make sure you, you you're aware of to compensate for that. But nope. Aperture. Um, I'll go off on a tangent with this one. Uh, problem with online is aperture. They tell you to change your depth of field. It's aperture. There's four factors, and so aperture is one of them. I choose aperture for exposure, but as soon as you move closer, 
your shallow your depth of field gets shallower so it blurs out faster and if you move back you actually get more depth of field so if i go to five one from let's say f8 and i go to five one but i want more depth of field but i want to change my exposure real quick i'll step back and it's one of the, it's just ingrained in my head. For anyone wondering, the other two factors is, is the more you zoom in, the shallower your depth of field. If you shoot at 85, the depth of field behind your subject is going to be shallower than if you're shooting at 35. Your composition looks different, but if you take a picture at 35 millimeters, guys, and 85, and you look at the picture, the background's blurrier on the 85 one. And so that's the other thing. Oh, the other one is really stupid. If you want your background to appear blurrier, Move the background further away. The closer your subject is to the background, the sharper it is. The reason why that's relevant, and I teach this in, uh, I teach this in uh, one of my classes, this is really important. Your camera can only focus on one thing. You have John here, you have Sarah here, you have Michael here. John's back here, Sarah's here, guess what? You focus on Michael, these are objects. These are not people. And so if you want them in focus, you move John up, you move Sarah back. That's, that's what you wanna do. So at a wedding, that's what I do. Hey guys, get in line, get in close. There you go, there's your line, adjust to whatever. Uh, why that's relevant is, now let's say you have one subject, you have John, and you're taking a picture of his hands. Well, if his hands are further away, you have to move them in closer. So number four is how close your background elements and your foreground elements are to your subject. So to answer that, when I change aperture, sometimes it's not for depth of field, it's just to get my exposure correct. Uh, mostly if I'm hitting the, like once again, I try not to hit limitations, or I try not to hit extremes. I was shooting with a, um, a studio strobe outside. I cannot go over 1 60th of a second on my 6D. My 5D Mark III would do 1 250th, but my 6D won't. And so I have to go ahead and sort of cap out my shutter speed in certain senses, and now either adjust ISO, which I hit an extreme at ISO 50, guys. I couldn't go to you know, I can't do any of that. And so aperture was what I, the, so the cool thing is it's complicated, but you also have three options that you can change to get the exposure you want. All right, guys, let's go to the next slide here. Yeah. That's you want it off, off camera. Yeah, off camera. And so, what, what do you suggest for kind of, like there are different options? There's different options. There's actually macro. Uh, what's really neat is your, your camera ends up looking like NCIS or a, like this little bug. Uh, there's a device, uh, Manfrotto has one where you connect it to the bottom of your camera and it's two articulating arms that hold your flash for you. And so, what's really neat about that is uh, you guys could build your own. You can have one where if you're taking a headshot of somebody, there's always a flash here and there's a flash that goes around them. You know, you can articulate the arms as you want there. Uh, but for the macro one, that's where you would like, ideally, um, if, you, uh, if you can, you would have an arm that holds a flash. So for anyone who has a tripod, you know, a ring light's good, but it, it's a flash that's right there and you might not like the look, at, look of it. So it really depends on what shadow quality and light quality you want. A uh, ring light gives you great subject clarity, but it's a light that's directly that one, you know, coming as a ring light direction. Uh, do you shoot your macros on a tripod? Yeah. All right, so you have your tripod. There's something that we're gonna cover on the next slide called the magic arm, where you super clamp it to your tripod and it's an arm that articulates and you can put your flash anywhere. And so that's the way you would do it with whatever softbox you want. The thing is, don't overdo it. You don't need a softbox that size over there because the closer you are to your subject with your light, the bigger the light source is. And so all you need to buy is one of those cheapo $8 softboxes that fit on your flash, and it's more than what you need. And, so, and that on a magic arm will position to wherever you want it to go. So, all right, so let's talk a little bit about uh, modifiers here, guys. We have your nice, simple unit in the umbrella. An umbrella makes your light source bigger. What does making your light source bigger do? Soften shadows. And so, here's a little Smith Vector 32 inch. It works. This is one of your thing. So, so you put, you, know, you put one on guys, you see the unit, and it intercepts the light, makes it bigger, you have a softer light. I hate umbrellas. 
I hate umbrellas. The reason why I hate umbrellas is you have a beautiful soft light over here, right, guys? And you have 60% of your light going back hitting nothing, doing absolutely zero. And so when you're working with these units that have a more finite amount of power when it comes to studio lights, that's 60% of power that, you know, now if you're at full power, that means your flash is taking longer to refresh and so forth. So my solution to that is I never buy umbrellas because for $2 more, you get Broly boxes. And what Broly boxes are is a umbrella that is essentially a portable soft box. That's all it is. So you have your umbrella portion. You either This is either straight black and this is clear, kind of like emulating that, or sorry, or this is white and this is straight black, or you have this one, which is a shoot-in, where it intercepts all the light, it has silver material on the inside, and it forces all out to one direction. And so if I see anyone who's shooting outside with a, you know, an umbrella, I don't ever say, hey, do this. You know, I'm not one of those type of guys. But I do know that they could get twice as much battery power using a Broly box because all of their flash power is going one direction and it's working. So pretty much what I've learned is that if Trent says he's not that kind of guy, he most certainly is. Nice. <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> and so uh, with the Broly box, guys, when you put it in, the unit covers it up. I mean, this one's meant more for a studio strobe, but uh, we get that going, and there you go. It works. So you have a flash unit. It's a big flash. You know, it works, and the soft light quality that comes off of it um, is the same as you would get from a soft box, and it's really cool. I mean, it, it works, and that's what it was. It's a last light soft lighter is the one that Ann Lebowitz used. It's a thinner material. And there's a, another difference, you don't have this bar. And so they actually cut it off where uh, this bar isn't in the way. So the reason why that's important is the bigger your light source, the softer your shadows. If you're trying to shoot a person right by the soft box, this gets in the way. So the last light does take this away. Or if you're good, just hacksaw it, you know, just, you know, just hand it yourself. I mean, they're 12 bucks each. You know, you can just go ahead and just mess with one and build it to whatever quality you want. So this soft box works really well. Or sorry, this Broly box. And I suggest Broly boxes over, um, over umbrellas. Uh, when I use studio lighting, I have Broly boxes everywhere because they are portable soft boxes, which leads into the third one. Soft boxes are a better looking umbrella. They're self, you know, they have, are, it's better build quality. This is one there. Chris, can you hold that one up? You know, it's a better presentation and all that. But it's a pain. Even that one, which is smaller, uh, is a little bit of a pain to, to deal with in comparison of opening an umbrella. And so um, the soft boxes, essentially, they make a light source bigger. Bigger light makes you know softer shadows, stuff like that. Um, but you know, I actually find them. I find them really nice. But when it comes to the main benefit that comes to uh, speed lights is portability. And this is one of the solutions I find makes it easier to use, which is a Broly box. A soft box does have one great option though, which is the next one. A soft box can be gridded. And did I add an effect to it? I don't want that effect on it. No, I'll worry about that later. This one is actually going, hitting the back and then being forced in. And this, Oh, uh, with the umbrella, it has to go through it. Or so you have to aim the light to it. And so in this case, you really wouldn't want to face this towards you because it's going to make a smaller light source. It goes in, it uh, fills it, in, you know, fills the umbrella in with light, and it goes from there. All right. I buy both because here's the thing with this one. Um, I can't aim it up. I know it seems really weird saying that, but I can only aim this one down. And on the other one, you can only aim at certain directions. And so it's kind of it's kind of wacky that way. Uh, Preference-wise, I use these, because this one, uh, um, with the other one, with the light pointing forward and so on, and this part is the part that's white, it's hard for me to get it consistently lit compared to the lead of this one, where you can just aim it anywhere, and more than likely you're gonna, gonna fill in as much as you need. Uh, Ease-wise, here's a, here's a slightly different one too. Uh, this is neat. It's 
Has anyone ever seen or seen that new thing from 3M, the water resistant stuff? You can buy this for 12 bucks and completely cover it with that. And it's actually encapsulating the unit and you're waterproof for a little bit. And so you can use a flash outside. You didn't hear me say that because if your flash gets screwed up, it's not my fault, guys. <laughs> you know, take your, take the precautions that you need, but you got, you get one of those and you go ahead and cover it with the, uh, the 3M thing. And it's a real life umbrella that is actually an umbrella for a photographer. And so it's useful. Uh, but yeah, the, this guy, this one right here works really well. And you guys saw how fast and easy the setup was. I'm ready to shoot, just like that. But a soft box, going to the first option, has a cool option, and that is you can grid it. Uh, you can also just grid flash itself. Uh, this is a great thing because what happens is when you use a general modifier, it puts out light roughly at 180 degrees, 160 degrees. You don't want light everywhere all the time, possibly. And so when you buy a grid, it actually constrains the beam. So we'll go ahead and show you guys that. Oh my God, did I take it out? I think I did. Uh, left or right? Right here. This right here, guys, is a grid for speed light. Relatively quick and simple. I go ahead and put this guy on. And right now, if you look, you know, it's a big beam. And then if I put the grid on, It's a controlled beam. And then you can stack grids on grids if you want and can beam even more. Um, or you can buy grids that are even thinner, which will, instead of being a 50 degree, it'll be a 40, a 30, a 20, a 10. So you can really constrain the beam. Really useful if you're doing hair lights and stuff like that, and you don't want your background to be completely lit. If I want to do a sort of a mystery type look, let me see here. Uh, Aaron, can I see you real quick? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, can you grid that? Uh, there's a lot of, um, thanks for mentioning that, because there's a lot of third party ones too where you could grid them too. They're just umbrellas that are in there. Uh, for anyone who's newer at photography, I envy you guys because there's so many great options now where beforehand we were stuck with $200 systems or nothing. So stand over there, huh? Mm -hmm. Oh, nice. Probably, I think, uh, Patrick, you have some like that, right? I don't know. He's a, but see, like this one will control the light. So if you don't want to hit her whole face, a grid system will work a little bit better. A snoot system does the same thing, um, and so forth. So, and then we're gonna get you set up in just a little bit to start shooting. All right, guys, light spheres, bounce cards. Uh, create a larger light source, but at, locally at your uh, flash. If you are using a, uh, you're using your flash a lot for events, bounce cards, light spheres, because that's going to allow you the portability or it will soften your light for you. But it's meant more for cameras or for flashes that are on your camera. That's the main difference, guys. If you're using a softbox, or if you're using your flash off camera, get a softbox. Don't get, don't try using a light sphere. Don't try using a bounce card. It's not as effective. But if you're on the go and you're moving around and that flash is on your camera, then those units are going to create a bigger light source for you, you know, in that way. For the cost effectiveness of them, it's not worth it. This is the one I was talking about for lights, or sorry, for my Dem Flip It. That's the advice right there. It just Velcro's on and creates a bigger card. Gel, add colors to light, creating neat effects. You guys will hopefully see that a little bit later. And one more thing here. Um, we have three more slides, guys, and then I'll show you real-time stuff. Super clamps, you guys saw that earlier. I'll let, area, oh, what's up? Yeah. I, copied the, uh, I copied the grid one over there. All right, so, wow, I didn't change any of these. <laughs> Chris, you can nail me on that one later. Uh, super clamps, you guys saw magic arms allow you to reposition the flash. Don't read the text, guys. And sandbags, why should you use sandbags, Chris? Don't take out a you don't take out a subject. You also hold a... Uh, you also hold your uh, your flash down and stuff like that. Or sandbags, something that's really useful too, is you have it on the floor and you can put your flash on it. Uh, it's this little surface that you can, it's malleable that you can move to whatever shape is needed to position your flash to whatever it needs to be. We've done that before, where if you're shooting a certain thing and your light stand doesn't go low enough, 
but if you try to put it if you try to put your flash on anything else and it just rolls over your sandbag has a shape where you can shape it to whatever whatever you need all right guys so speed lights benefits and warnings and this is last uh there's only two slides left uh there are more benefits of flashes than there are negatives here's some of the things to be aware of this is a critical one this is why some people actually or some people don't realize flash freezes subjects in place um, and in many ways create a sharper image if you open or if you if i take a picture of you you guys one of you guys are just you know you're just sitting there and i take one sixtieth of a second if i use a flash within that one sixtieth of a second window a flash will fire for one ten thousandths or one thousandth of a second and permanently lock your subject in place if you're ever wondering why a flash image looks clearer than an available light image it's exactly that because within that time frame that you're opening your shutter your flash is instantly going off and freezing your subject in place when you shoot a subject, not only are you capturing their movement, you're capturing your movement. So these are some of the things that people don't consider. And so the longer your shutter speed, the more movement you pick up on their end and the more of your movement that you pick up. And so a flash will quickly just lock it in place. And so will you see a difference with a more expensive flash? You actually will. If Profoto says that their flash goes off at full power at one ten thousandth of a second, it does. You will capture your subject in one ten thousandth of a second. And where is that relevant? Has anyone ever seen a picture of a frozen bullet, like a bullet in midair? It takes a lot of flash power. You actually have to, if you, uh, if you want to, you have to build a flash that can kill you to get to one forty thousandth of a second. You can build it with stuff from Radio Shack, but it's kind of scary. Uh, but... That's the idea here because it's a difference of one, ten thousandths of a second, but you can see a blurry bullet and you can see a sharp bullet. That is actually kind of how it works with us. If your subject is moving around, any of you, anyone here available light shooters, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you ever use a flash in the same situation, I can almost guarantee you if you do it right and you use the flash to supplement the light, not replace it, your photos with the flash will look better than the photos with the available light. Yeah, your six speed's low enough. But let's say you did a one second exposure and you use a flash. Within that one second window, your flash will expose and lock your subject in place. And so it's, really, it's, it's actually kind of different, uh, different that way because if your subject is not as well lit as the background and your flash goes off, within that window, your subject's going to appear really clear and you're going to still pick up the ambient light in the background. That's how people shoot sports. Mm -hmm. Like just with a flash. Mm -hmm. They must be using the ambient light. Well, yeah, but they are also using flash to lock them in place and also illuminate them. They vary. It depends. Like um, you actually also get experience as you do sports because uh, if you ever, I mean, if you see someone doing a jumper, you don't get them when they're here or halfway in the air. You get them when they're in peak motion and they actually move slower. And so sports shooters know that. But with the flash too, it locks them in place. Uh, because if that's the only light that's pumping in, the background ambience being picked up, but that flash locks them in place and actually delivers exactly what we're talking about, a sharper, clearer image. But if their exposure's too long, you will see the ghost of the subject moving. But if it's short, it's almost like an insurance policy. That flash is that extra icing on the cake that locks your subject in place. So, mm -hmm. I'm trying to uh, get some more. Uh... Slow shutter speed on the small movement. I had a lot of the people who were getting photographed in these uh, data flows, and they were sitting in the creek with the water going around back. I think I kind of get them to be still and everything. Uh, with a slow shutter speed, how do you do? Couldn't you use a flash to help that? Yeah. Yeah. Do you have to focus it on the subject? You focus it on subject, but also what you do, here's something that's important is uh, we didn't mention it up here, but we should mention it. There's something called second curtain sync and first curtain, when you open a flash for, or when you open your camera for one second, if you have it on first curtain sync, the flash goes off instantly. And then for one second it opens, and then it's done. On second curtain sync, your camera says, okay, instead of flashing in the beginning, right before I close my shutter, I'm gonna flash. And why that's relevant is um, if your subject are just moving a little bit and you flash them in the beginning, then everything they do afterwards is going to go ahead and be a top layer on top of what you just caught. But if you wait till the end, 
you have you're picking them up slightly and at the very end it flashes that's your sharp image and so does that make sense to everyone so that's second curtain sync and first curtain sync right there and why you would choose that and so your case there though you're dealing with you're dealing with options that are really difficult it's a trying thing you want to make your subject comfortable too and also do poses that promote it and so a lot of things that we do with longer exposure is subjects laying down subjects asleep subject is with their eyes closed you know you can still do the same lovey duck pose but don't open eyes because if one person blinks you know and so just go ahead and say close your eyes so those are the things that we can control on another aspect like that if you ever do newborn photos plan it within the first 10 days because that's when they're always asleep chris i think you do that so but like if you go if you go past 10 days baby's awake all the time and baby's rowdy first 10 days angel won't do anything get your shots done there Talk to the mom and say you got to get it done now. Otherwise, you're not going to be happy with your photos. Uh, you just kind of you kind of push it because that's how you control it as a photographer. That, does that make sense though about the uh, the thing freezing in place? That's one of the benefits. Of one of the things that make your photos look different than people who say I like using available light. Well, guess what? You can do available light supplemented by a flash, and that flash is making your images look better than the subject who's just using available light itself. All right, so flashes do create heat. Use higher ISO and a lower power and you can shoot more. The SB900, an amazing flash. I think all of us agree with it. Nikon went extremely, extremely annoying on its heat, like a you know, heat index turn off. You get like eight full power flashes and the flash tells you I'm not working anymore for 10 minutes. The SB910 addressed it. I believe the SB710 addressed that. Um, it sucks. And so something that to not forget, guys, is you, if you are shooting either ISO 200 or 400, go to 800. You know, you won't notice the difference in static really more likely if you get the exposure nailed down. But if you go to 800, instead of being full power on the flash, you're at half power. So if you're using ISO 100, you can go to ISO 800, and all of a sudden your flash is going from half power to one eighth power. And you can shoot that much more. And so, and you are, are the heat's not going to be bad. Uh, bullet point number four here, or, you know, third on the list. Get comfortable with your flash so you can change it without even looking at it. Here's something that's really neat. I'm going to go ahead and uh, kind of sell you guys a little bit more on this one. Uh, this flash that I showed you guys earlier actually has a really neat wireless trigger that you can buy for it for 40 bucks. And you can actually remotely change the power on it. And it actually will tell you what the power is at. And so you don't even have to go up to the unit on this flash. You could spend $30 and remotely control the power of it. And it actually tells you what the power is on the remote. And so you can say, okay, my unit's at 164 power. I want it at 1 8th. And the unit will show you that. And the cool part about it is, is you don't even have to have it on your camera. You can just have it in your pocket, change the power, and use whatever flash controller that you have. And so, uh, so Patrick has a couple. I have a couple, and that's what I do at a wedding. I'll put it up somewhere. It's 13 feet in the air. I put it on channel A, and I'm like, all right, it's at 1 8 power. I want it down to 1 32nd. I just do that on the transmitter, hit test, turn it off, and now it's permanently at 1 32nd until I change it back again. And so, um, and so you get comfortable with your unit. The reason why, huh, that sounds weird saying that. But anyways, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> Well, that, <laughs> that's permanently on the internet. But anyways, uh, here's, the, here's the thing, though. Like, um, you're working with your subject. Work with your subject. You know, the flash equipment, that's all great for us to talk about. But it gets to a certain point where if you find yourself fiddling too much with your flash and adjusting it, don't forget you're shooting with the subject um, because they're the ones either paying the bills or the ones that you want to keep on shooting that more and so on. So just don't forget about your subject. And the very last one here is speed lights are not as strong compared to studio flashes. It gets to a point where studio flash is a better idea. A couple of things. You're drawing power off a studio or you're drawing power off a wall with a studio strobe more than likely. And so it's consistently going to run fast. You're not dealing with batteries. The other option that studio, our studio lights have is there's a built-in modeling light it will actually go ahead and be nice. So the review that I did of the, um, the Mago Speedlight, which I really like, actually has two LEDs up front, which will light up and show you what your light kind of looks like 
on your flash. That was really cool. I was really, I was really, uh, I really liked that idea on that one, but it still wasn't that strong of a light. Uh, the other thing too is the bigger your light source, the softer the shadows, but the more power it takes. See that big uh, um, unit right here? It's giant, right? That is a 600 watt unit right there. And it barely lets you shoot 5.6 at ISO 400, barely, at full power. That modifier is just so huge, it's killing that flash by like 16, 18 stops, running at full power. So this guy right here would not make a dent in that. You put this in there and you have to shoot ISO 800 at 1.4 to get you know, to get that effect. And so there's certain points where these aren't as useful. And you can Joe McNally it and put nine speed lights together and kind of jury rig something there, or you can buy one strobe and do the exact same thing. And, and be Yep. Yep. And these guys, I mean, they put out they put out a lot more power than you would expect, but when it gets to certain points, that's why you combine systems. What I really find cool, though, guys, is these lights supplement studio lights really well. Uh, if you buy a studio light and you buy this, you can combine them all together. They're not in, uh, exclusive systems. This guy with a grid right here is a perfect hair light. You put this behind your subject, you have your alien bee over there, you have this light here, it works perfectly fine. A light is a light. You know, simple as that. All right, guys, last slide here, and we show you a little bit about it. All right, making magic, guys. Speed lights offer a world of opportunity to make some photography magic. You don't have to use them as your main source of light. I want to go ahead and say that. You're outside with the sun. Who here saw outside today and thought it was really cool? It's a nice, it's a nice soft light day, right? You don't have to use your speed light right on your subject. What you can do is you can shoot like normal and shoot it there, but then put this light behind them and use it as a kicker light behind them. That's what makes us stand out among other photographers. We take this light and we put it behind your subject and now it separates them from the background. And so you're using the available light that's already there, but you're supplementing it with this light. So that's how you start making you know, some magic with the uh, photography equipment you have. You have one light, that's all you need, and you put it behind your subject. It doesn't always have to be right directly in front of your subject there. All right, so use the existing light uh, and supplement it with them. So that's what I do for weddings and all that. If someone lights a venue, well, they took their time to light a venue nicely. What you can do is, here's a trick with it. Let's say there's light back here and there's light over there. Move your subject to where it's really dark and then put the light on them and you balance it, or you balance your exposure to capture the background, but your subject's not lit by any external light, right guys? The only thing your subject is lit by is your light. So you capture your subject lit by your light, but also the background lights. And then when you balance that correctly, that's where you get those killer shots where you see people lit by the photographer, but the background's perfectly exposed also. You know, that's how, that's how they do it. Yes, you have to mess with white balance and so on, but this is an introductory class, so I'm not gonna go ahead and like, uh, bore you with that detail. All right, guys, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a quick break and we're gonna do a hands-on demonstration using only speed lights that we set up. You guys are welcome to shoot with, uh, you guys are welcome to shoot also with Aaron. We're gonna turn the lights on. I gotta set my camera up um, and to get ready for the online broadcast. So what we're gonna do is, uh, you guys can go shoot with Aaron. Aaron, can I have you out here? And can you guys hit the lights on over there? One quick question. Yeah. Yes, I was. Okay. So actually, let's go. Let's go to that real quick, and let's talk about uh, example photo or the photos. All right. So going going to this, guys. Looking at these shots, is there anyone who has any questions concerning this? Is using the same concept of using a flash outside? And I guess, sorry, can we hit the lights one more time down? I apologize. So holy crap, twenty seven hundred photos synced. This is not anything complicated, guys. It's just exposing the background and lighting the subject. Uh, the shadow on the subject is slightly soft, which denotes a bigger light source. But once again, the only thing we used today was this. And the flash was pretty strong. It was like at 120 watts. So you would have to have two, uh, two small flashes almost at full power. But we weren't pumping like 640 watts of power through the flash. But uh, 
with this, uh, this is once again, just this flash unit, and you can immediately shoot outside uh, with it and get great results, uh, including getting the sky in. Uh, for if anyone's wondering, like, how do you expose the sky with your subject? Take your first shot without a light in and get your exposure of the sky correct. That's all you do. Once that's correct, your subject is probably dark. Uh, your subject's not lit. And then you introduce your light in and you up your power until your subject's lit well with that. It's really quick and easy. Um, all right, so you guys have any questions concerning any of these photos that you see or like anything on the lighting side? Uh, oh, here, here. Um, a kicker was not used at all because um, uh, we only it's this is all one light once again one light using a um, uh, using just the umbrella and uh, the subject just in one place uh, the light actually is it varies around yeah this was the, uh, the clouds today it was pretty cool it's right off Lake Lanier so so the light uh, varies, but it's mostly closer to the camera. This one's slightly on camera right. I believe you guys saw like saw this earlier. And something I will go ahead and point out, this is more my ammo with it. These are off, right off camera. There's no editing or so on. So I try to shoot. When I do lighting, I try to get lighting as correct as I can and try to get the exposure as I can. So, you know. Yep, just a Brawly box. This, this, one, this exact one right here. So, oh. oh, in this case, I went more for uh, at 4.5, um, 40, uh, sorry, 40 millimeters. So with this one, we did lower the light power of the uh, flash because, once again, I am shooting an initial frame and uh, seeing what the exposure is. Uh, let me see if I figure out where the light is. And saying, okay, at... Uh, at 4.5, I'm not getting as much of the fire as I want. And so I moved it to, uh, actually, it's still 4.5 there. But uh, it's also angle there. And yeah, no, I just make sure the fire looks good on the screen. I mean, really, that's it. And then adjust as needed. Uh, since the flash, the flash isn't affected by my sync speed, if I wanted more of the fire in or less, like, you know, let's say if the background was really bright, the fire is probably going to be brighter, right, guys? Because it's a light source with an extra light source, which is the fire. Well, if I lower or if I speed up my shutter speed, the light or the fire is going to be more prominent because the background darkens. That's what I'll do. So it will show up. And so that's the mindset I have. So I'll jack it from 160th of a second to 120th, 125th or 100th. So, all right. Is there any other question, guys? I'm going to share a quick little real-life scenario with my wife. Drunk bride after we even come up, and she's like, We may need to do a spark trip right now. Because I mean, this is long, but we do not do. She wanted to do like the intricate design or twirls or something like that. Well, okay, come on. let's go get your spark trip. She has one spark trip left. Oh. So <laughs> there's no time for trial and error. You have to kind of kind of know, okay, let's put your super where the background is. Let me see from my. <laughs> it's later. We're a little dramatic here. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, everyone, just take a quick break. What we're going to go ahead and do is uh, we're going to get, yeah, lights on. We're going to set it up so everyone can take photos uh, and try out the studio lights. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm setting up. Feel free to ask Chris or, Ann, or, Chris or Patrick. Okay. Perfect. I don't think I brought my um, 
Did I not bring my, uh, shit, my webcam. I don't believe I brought it. So, uh, go back. It's the online people. Hey, buddy. Yeah, watch that bag. There's a snake in it. Uh. Hmm? You can use yours. Yeah, you can. Yeah. Yeah. Um. No, it works. Yeah. But, uh, yep. So. That's all there is to it. You should, one. Yeah. You should now be able to take a shot. Sorry, well, Sorry, what was the question? Oh. Oh, unfortunately, no. But uh, what we'll do is uh, just record it. Actually, uh, so, hey guys, online. I don't know if anyone's viewing. What we're gonna do is see how this looks. Hey, how's it going? So, uh, for anyone who's online, uh, I know the quality is terrible. I apologize. I didn't bring my webcam, and I'm really sorry about that, guys. What we're gonna try to show is at least set up the setup real quick on my uh, my uh, webcam here. Wow, I look absolutely terrible in this thing. But anyways, uh, in the back here is the Broly box that we talked about before. Essentially, uh, it's set up. We're going to put Aaron in front of it, right by the wall. Uh, really basic. I'm going to show them a headshot with the uh, with the Broly box. You see me uh, flashing it there. Uh, feel free to stay with us. Uh, it's pretty boring from here on, uh, but I'm going to keep this streaming, and you guys will hear me answer any questions that anyone may have. And then we're going to complicate it a little bit more as it goes on. But first of all, we're going to go ahead and start shooting here. Let me uh, clear some stuff up. Hey, Joel. If I can, if you can grab these and just move it out of the way. And then let me grab. Thank you. All right, guys. All right. So, Aaron, can I have you up here, hon? I'm sorry. Right. Actually, can we take them out or? Yeah. We'll, we'll do a few in the beginning and we'll let them rest. All right, guys. Um, actually, we'll start this way so they can see it. All right, guys, uh, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, know how to start this, I'm going to go ahead and show you guys how I start this real quick for anyone who's interested. Uh, all right. And if you're afraid of snakes, he doesn't bite. But this is a really, uh, I think you guys can see it's a really unique opportunity to get something slightly different. So, all right. Nope. And Erin is one of our veteran meet and shoot models. She is amazing. Uh, and she works with a lot of, uh, if you guys have any ideas, feel free to give her your information. She's a great person to work with. Erin, step back just a little bit. And so about right there. All right, uh, a little bit closer. So here's something silly that I do, guys. When it comes to settings, I put my camera at a generic ISO 200. I put it at 5.6, and I don't put a trigger on it, and I take a shot. Complete black. Perfect. The reason why this is perfect is there is no light in here that is making our, is showing up in my photo. Normally, I take it, not necessarily all the time, but this is a quick first shot because now I know the only light that I'm getting is this one. And so now I put the uh, trigger on. So I'm at ISO 200, 5.6 at 125th of a second. And it's dark. So that tells me I either have two options. I can turn the power up on the flash or I can change the settings on my camera. I'm not going to change the settings on my camera. I'm going to go ahead and up the power. I'm going to move it to... I start at 1 8th. And so I'll, if I move the light in closer, it's also more intense. And so now I move it in closer to her. And there you go. That's how quick and easy it was. I up the power, I move the light in. And that's how fast and easy I started shooting. If I didn't like the placement of light, here's, a, here's where I was saying it earlier. 
If you guys don't like a shadow, what's on the opposite side of the shadow, guys? The light. So if you don't like a shadow, move the light that's casting it. That's how it works. And now that you, um, when you took the first shot, it was completely black, right? So it tells you the only light is this light. And so that means you know this is the only light you move. Uh, re why do I break it so simple, guys? Here's the thing. When I teach people, complicated things are only a bunch of obvious things put together. It only gets complicated because you're worrying about all these little hurdles that you have to jump over. If you break it down to the basic level, and that things just don't get complicated anymore because you just handle all those bullet points and you don't really worry about it. In this case, one of the most complex, one of the most obvious things is on the opposite side of where this is the shadow. You know, that's it. You move the light to wherever you need to. Go ahead and look over here. So, and look towards the light. And so that's how you quickly start shooting. And it's a nice, beautiful, soft light. Let me go ahead and put it on the screen. See if I can show you guys. Mm -hmm. And so the final setting that I have settings wise is 5.6 guys at ISO 200. Uh, online, let me go ahead and broadcast my screen here. Share. models. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and that looks, would you guys be able to tell if that was a pro photo light or a $60 softbox? Or sorry, a $60 light? Not really. I mean, this is a speed light you paid 100 bucks for, and you're getting it in a nice softbox. So let me go ahead and rotate that. And uh, for anyone wondering who, why I'm shooting in black and white, I shoot RAW plus JPEG. When you shoot in black and white, color is one of the things that we look at that you can easily fix, but lighting you can't fix in post-processing as well. Black and white shows you truly how your light falls. And so I shoot in black and white camera because the most important thing to me is light. Color I can fix. I don't want to tell a subject I can fix the color. You know, it's not about that, but think of all the, the little steps that you have to use to fix your photos. Lighting is one on Photoshop that takes at least 30 minutes to fix. Color takes sub five minutes. So I don't worry about color as much as I worry about hitting the subject. And in this case, in the black and white, what can you guys tell with where the light's positioned? Camera left. Shadows are on the, the shadows are on her, our, our right side, her left. And so my black and white shot immediately tells, tells that, you know, in light position wise. All right, so going back to, you know, so that's the first one. Is that a usable shot, guys? How fast did it take us to get there? Fairly quick. So when you do your first shot and it's completely black, you know that's the only light there, you make it less complicated. You know these other lights don't matter. They do absolutely nothing. None of these lights here will ever affect your final exposure. The only light that matters is this one right here. And so that's how you quickly shoot with these lights anywhere you're at. All right, guys, so uh, you don't have to use the, uh, the light here, but we only have one, one flash. So feel free to move around, but whoever has this uh, has possession of Aaron to pose for this. Try snapping about two or three shots and then pass it on. Feel free to take as many pictures of you want as Aaron, but be nice, and if you guys can leave her a tip if possible, uh, it's gas money for her to go home. What's really cool though is this is really neat. If you get a shot that you really want because you've never had a person with a snake before and you want it for your portfolio, I'm not pushing releases, but a release is 10 bucks on any any night like this. And you guys, it's a commercial release. So anyone want to shoot first, guys? Any volunteers? Yep. ISO 200, 5.6 at 1 one twenty fifth of a second. What you can do is feel free to move the light around and uh, yeah. so forth. The Photix kind of does, but it, it doesn't do it as well as the other ones. Uh, online, I'm going to go ahead and guys, I'm going to put you back on uh, the screen here. Uh, you'll see people working with Aaron. Let me see here. Sorry about that. Is there any new, completely new members that made it here? I'm Trent. Oh, Trent. Go on. Go on. Thank you for making it out. So. Hope you guys got something out of it. John. Hey, John. Did you guys get anything? Hi. Hey, Patty. So, oh, no problem. Uh, make sure to talk to Chris also. He's uh, he's my business partner. What was that? Do I remember you? Oh, I do, but I don't. That's right. Oh, Charles, you've lost so much weight. 
I guess that was right when I quit eating meat. That's yeah, it's crazy, I Charles. Oh my God. How are, how are the pit bulls or how are the how are yeah, dogs? Sure. We've had a challenging yeah. year. Yeah, yeah challenge. Oh man. It's really it's it's been yeah, it's, it's, heartbreaking. It's good man. Seeing you, man. It's been fun for you too, bro. Yeah. I was just telling my sister if I had one thing to do over at Gwinnett Tech, I would have latched onto this guy. <laughs> shooting, man. Uh, oh my goodness. Uh, thank you, man. Yeah, some great questions there. Hey, Sean. How's it going? Say, hey, I'm heading out. I'm oh, man. So. I, need to give you that I need to get you that battery and that charger for the 20D. Yeah, I, guess we'll have to, so. I completely forgot about that. Yeah, so. I'll, I'll come by your, your place yeah. sometime, or I'll try to remember. I've completely forgotten about it until you just mentioned it. Oh, man. Right. Good to see you. I'm good to see you again, buddy. So. Guys, any, uh, any of you guys have any questions from uh, about tonight? Yeah, one question. Yeah. Like, um, when you are trying to use a flash like this, right, mm -hmm. what is the good size of the softbox or the umbrella? I just use the 42 inch. It's a good one to start at. You know, that's this. That, some power may lose yeah, it's bigger, and then you know, this one's less bulky. This one's a, uh, this one just works well and it's portable. So it's what 24 inch. Oh, this one's a 42 inch right there. Yep. So. Yep. so uh, the Godex one it is, but this one, the TT850, was a hundred bucks. Yeah. So I'm assuming it's going to be about 110, because the Godex one that I have is a um is a automatic one mm -hmm. this one's a full man so okay. feel free to pick it up and uh try it out and see this one did you say you did you're not as i don't recommend it this way with the newer ones but mm -hmm. cheetah rebranded them okay. and they went through them and did the testing and they offer a warranty okay so this one's like straight from china you have 30 days mm -hmm. and so if it, if it breaks after the 30 days screw it. cheetah i mean things aren't designed to break they do at least you have the warranty. Are they companies? When I look at Godex, a lot of these came up. They uh, they're not related. Essentially, one other company creates it, and then they bought, they okay. bought, you know, they bought the bulk. So there's a and tag so, somewhere that's yeah, exactly. And so, so. Cool. so you would never shoot so that it reflects. The I would avoid it, but I, you know, never. I will say never is a a strong word. Okay. No, you know, it's one. That's how you use it. It's it's efficiency because if you're shooting through, it works. But if you're also bouncing, it works, but you're losing, you're losing power. Mostly if you're outside, the most inefficient way to use this is when you're outside and half your power is going back and lighting a bird or an airplane over there. That's not even being captured. And so a light like this, if you watch, it'll work either way. It'll work either way. It'll work either way. But of course, so that'll just go ahead and turn it off. Okay. So people shoot through these. That's how you do it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's gonna, it's going back to the sports thing. I, I shoot sports, mm -hmm. but I never use. But I always use available light. Mm -hmm. But if I'm shooting basketball, game, which I mm -hmm. shoot basketball game, if I'm going to shoot it with a flash, mm -hmm. I'm going to need a six feet of one sixty, a one one sixty, mm -hmm. right? But if you use your uh, company's flash, like, you know what? like who are you, Nikon or Canon? Nikon. If you use Nikon, uh, example, and you enable F Sync. It'll actually shoot to whatever sync speed that you go to. It'll shoot at whatever sync speed you go to. So if you decide to shoot basketball at one eight hundredth of a second, right. your flash will fire at one eight hundredth of a second. I use a high speed sync. Yeah. Thing? Okay. So right. it's going to use a little bit more power, but you have to use high speed sync to do it. Exactly. To do it the way that. And so, yep. And on Nikon, it's called F sync. So if you talk to Chris, he'll tell you. It's it's super easy, but it's that's how you just enable it. So otherwise, you're not when you're using. Available lights, so you'd have to be doing it. If you were if you were relying more on the available light, you'd have to be using a high speed sync or an F sync. Right. Exactly. So or you yep. have a trail. Yeah. Or you don't necessarily have a trail, you but get the flash from the whole frame. Exactly. You get the black bar. Yep. So and so you'll still see it. You'll still see it lit. You won't see the black bar as much because your flash is not hitting the whole screen. Because uh, when you're in a studio, you really see the black bar because your lights illuminating. Like in this situation, yeah, and because this is all your lighting bar. But if you use, uh, if you're out there, you know, available light, what you'll see is it's lit here, but then all of a sudden it gets a lot dramatically darker there. It's still you still see the band. It wouldn't be a. It would be a distinct band. Like it's obvious. Like mostly, if you're shooting at an angle, you'll see like a band on their face. But it's more of a slight gradient where it's not dramatically black, and then it's going to be just darker on the subject here okay. and lit there. Uh, I, mean, I don't want to use flash for sports, but somebody was telling me they didn't want me to do it for this one shoot. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. oh that's so cool. Was that it? That's uh, it, yeah. Uh -huh. Um, I mean, this is one example of just one technique. In a situation like this, where you have a lighting here, 
Mm -hmm. But uh, you don't. I mean, when you take this in the light room, you know, it, it drastically reduces the light. Uh, right now, since the lighting is mostly hitting her up there, you can see with that. If you position the light further back, your intensity goes down, but your coverage increases. And so, if you're able to move the light back, you'll get more increase in coverage. Yeah, but. Uh, in Lightroom, how do you fix it? Or no, no, no. I was trying to take some kids' portraits. Mm -hmm. uh, I was using like put the light at the higher angle mm -hmm. and try to. So this part was well lit. And, and it got a lot darker. Lot so darker. what you want to do is move the light back. When you move your light back, your coverage goes from being over here to increasing in size, but the intensity of the light decreases. So you have to up your exposure, or you have to up the power on the light. Instead of being, let's say, half power over here, it's going to be, you know, full power or even more, or yeah, like whatever you can do. So that's where Studio Light works because you also can do add a lot more power in. So it is about moving the light back and increasing the size, or you can use a bigger softbox, which creates a bigger light source, stuff like that. So, well, this was your first one. Do you have a great man? I got a lot of it. Though. Oh, awesome. Thanks. Man. Appreciate it. I'll no problem. Back again. Great. There's a, yeah, there's a holiday portrait one coming up, I believe. The Atlanta ones will be easier for me. Yeah, it's a, that's the thing. So. It wasn't that bad. I thought, I thought it was going to be a nightmare. I mean, I left at like 5.30, I thought. It's going to be a nightmare it heading. It wasn't that bad. What part of Atlanta do you live in, though? Virginia Highlands. Virginia Highlands. The only part that was bad was 285. Which I was stopped. But besides for that, I was, 70, I was going 70 miles an hour. Be careful on the way back tonight. Look at your Google map. Because 400, they've been doing construction on uh, exit 5. Okay. And then they've been closing two lanes, yeah. which so uh, you might want to go ahead and uh, um, take Jimmy Carter all the way to uh, 85. I mean, it's inconvenient, but I think it's about a 45 minute to an hour. Take Jimmy uh, Carter. Jimmy Carter, or uh, take anything you can to go to 85. Or, so not 400 at all. Yeah, I think uh, I think 400 is. Uh, they're still working on it. Actually, I'll ask. Hey guys, does anyone know if uh, is 400 still being worked on tonight? At uh, exit five or exit six, does anyone know? Because it's it's been killing it's been killing traffic. It so. wasn't that bad. No. Awesome, man. Let me uh, I'm gonna go ahead and set up another one. I'm actually gonna dip on you here, but you need anything? No, actually, uh, do you wanna? Um, I have to do a event tomorrow night at Emory, but I had a shoot booked with uh, Kim for Joel. Do you wanna go to the office and shoot with uh, Joel and Kim? Yeah, yeah I can night? do that. All right. Uh, I'll give him the keys, but uh, he's gonna. Him and I are shooting. If you're not busy tomorrow, him and I are shooting at the Railway Museum. But then I have an event for Emory. Okay. I'll, I'll talk to you. I'll tonight. give you a shout. Yeah. yeah. I'll talk to you tonight. When are you shooting your second? So. Uh, I'm doing the. So. All right, guys. What I'm gonna do is add an extra light in in the back, also. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I need the. Uh, excuse me. Sorry. And uh, I will be out of this light. Hey, Elizabeth. Elizabeth, come back here. Sorry. Did they, did they charge you? What's up? Did they charge you? Yeah. Because I have a forty dollar credit that I don't. I'm never going to use it. Oh yeah. So. No, no, we don't know. We're just I'll give you. I'll give you my login because I'm never going to use it. So. Thank you. Hopefully, you'll get some tips. Also, got a twenty for you for gas. So. Can I see you? I don't know. Who has it? Hey guys, whoever has the uh, trigger is one who has uh, 
So, oh, actually, this one is not on. Okay, perfect. Right. Yes, it is. So. So I would pick this from Cheetah. Right. Well, the Godex I would get, but the Godex is uh, Godex is going to be a little bit more expensive. Uh, the reason I got the Godex is because it's the automatic version. Uh, the Cheetah ones are all manual. So if you I mean it supports TTL, it's TTL and so on. And so it was a uh, it was because I believe in redundancy. I had a 600EX uh, the Canon, and so I didn't want to buy another 600EX. So I bought that. Okay, that's what I want as a backup. I only have a 580, mm -hmm. but same thing. I want yep. another 580, but I'm like, I don't really want to spend it. Once you go to that, $600. yeah, once you go to that, going back to the five, because that one does, it even does the wireless communication, the uh, infrared based one that uh, Canon has in the 580. And so it doesn't do the radio, but it does. And so plus it does all the other one. And if you're doing studio stuff, that one too, you can also enable it to. Uh, sync with a uh, remote flash. So, yeah. are you using the TTL through the Codex transmitters? Yep. Oh. Oh, yeah, please. Thank you. Yeah. So, so those are TTL transmitters? Uh, the Codex is a TTL pass through. Uh, the version I have is a, uh, if you look on the very top, sorry, I hit it, but um, yeah. On uh, the settings on this one is ISO 200 at 1 125th 1 a second. Uh, yeah, here's the, so here's a transmitter, and the Nikon one will have the respective things, but it will pass through your TTL, mm -hmm. but it will manually trigger any flash. Okay. So uh, the receivers, even though they have uh, the TTL like transmitter ports, they're just manual. Okay. So, As I mentioned in the description, it says TTL, but it's really just TTL passer. Pass it's not like the pocket was as many exactly. TTLs. That, okay. But then with the satellite ones, I have them at. Am I something? Oh, she's a she actually is a little bit further. So go ahead and move to or up your ISO to four hundred. I would up your ISO to four hundred. There you go. So yeah, that's pretty like you were saying something about the uh, I mentioned the pocket was there's TTL and it doesn't do that. Yeah, the Pocket Wizard TTL, the issue there is if you have this unit, or sorry, this unit on top of your camera, mm -hmm. and you turn it off, right. you can't fit, you can't fire your main unit. Right. With the, or sorry, with the, uh, with the Pocket Wizard. With this one, you turn it off, it doesn't affect anything. You just turn off those. So that's and so, the benefit of that. Yep. And then the Pocket Wizard benefit is that it actually is true, ETC, true TTL. Yep, but there are, these, there are these units that do TTL. Same brand? Same brand. Uh, okay. Photix is uh, Odin. The Odin triggers do TTL, um, and I think the Mitros, but then uh, there's a couple other companies too that do it. And so, like, if you talk to Sheldon, the, the ball guy over there, uh, he has the young new 622s, and they do TTL. So, I have the pocket for many, but. Again, if you buy additional flashes, yep. and then for every too. and then every pocket wizard so is like one seventy nine. Yeah. Each of these units is a dumb because those satellite ones, I don't need TTL with them. Right. You know, I just need general usage. Mm -hmm. So each of these, each receiver is forty bucks. Okay. You know. That, that makes that's definitely right. Uh, and you mentioned a little pocket device you have where you can dial in yep. and actually dress the manual. So, yep. Uh, on each of these units, there's a radio. Uh, there's a uh, transmitter that you can. Uh, get with it and a receiver okay. and the receiver uh, once you put it in well it's a direct communication or bilateral communication okay and it'll tell you your settings but you can also remotely adjust it so that's a new flash not related to this uh yeah it's actually it's yeah. a it's accessory, it, for accessory for the flash itself <laughs> yeah if, uh, you know let me see if i can load it up for you just to show you uh, on uh hey guys so <laughs> It's like a fake pocket wizard, mm -hmm. but this is it right here. Uh, check just goes trench out. Okay, so, so yeah, you just put that on the side of the unit, okay. and if you'll notice, it shows you the settings. Mm -hmm. You go to whatever respective channel that you want, mm -hmm. and it the unit responds back. You hit test. It locks into the unit, and it shows you the exact power it's at. And then how much are those? Those are thirty bucks. It's kind of crazy. It's like so just one of these for each. Uh, one of these, but yeah, one of these for each light, and then this one, and that's a master unit that controls all. Yep. 
So I don't think they sell it yet, but at thirty bucks, it's kind of you'll have like sixteen, yeah. like whatever, five extra of those. But when they sell those separately, it's almost a no-brainer. It's like you have one on each flash. And uh, let me see if I have oh, one. This is newer. Okay. Yep. So that's. that's this one. Yeah. Yep. Let me see if I have a. Let me see if I have that back unit because you'll see, like the relative size of it. Yeah. So, this is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So, did you get any photos? Of, oh, I did. Awesome. So, so here's you know the flash unit here. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I don't have. It's powered by the battery or the flash itself, so mm -hmm. there's no battery to worry about. Okay. And it goes right in. And so you put it on whatever channel you want, so you can independently put it on, um, like put this on one. So if you adjust zero, mm -hmm. it doesn't affect this. And so what you may want to do is kind of like just paint, you know, mm -hmm. you know, paint a one or something on it, or put a label. And uh, yeah, so that's it. Does Godos have a similar thing? Yeah. Oh, these are universal. I mean, they're all. And so with these newer ones, just you buy a bunch of newer ones. Right. And because it's, it's the unit. What happened with the newer one is it's not the unit that's bad. They got a bad batch of batteries. And so you can actually feel it here. This one is an issue. That little bulb in the center. And so it's you can feel like right here if you feel carefully. If you get a bad one, it expands even further. Oh, really? And the cell goes yeah, back. The yeah. Where with the Godex one, uh, it's being used right now. They got they got good cells. And so essentially it's a newer bought a bad batch. Mm -hmm. And now they're dealing with the repercussions of that where Godex and Cheetah has gone through, you know. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yep. so here's the question. Did you leave with at least three things that you didn't know before? Oh, absolutely. More than three. So. Yeah, no, no. So, yeah. One of my goals is I wanted to know. I wanted a reliable, inexpensive flash out here. Uh huh. So that's one item. This is two. Yeah. Yeah. That's three. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. That's great. So, yeah, that was so, very, very I'm happy then. So. Yeah, I do. I mean, I did the thing in school, but we're gonna, and we're, but we're gonna need to ask some questions about what we need to start. Of course, with man. And, and I'll give you a buddy. I'll give you guys a buddy pass discount or whatever. I do one on ones, but with the lighting stuff. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We well, just like I said, you do so good in these, man. I don't, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, but just uh, just make sure to hit more of these, Trev. So, yeah, we're going to. Yep. Yeah. But uh. I need to go back. I only have three classes to finish it. I never did. Math, portfolio, and final. Dude, I failed two remedial math classes. I said I'm out of here. Yep. So, <laughs> I took my couple certificates yeah, and I left. Yeah, it's pretty. I should just go. You know, I got the. That is unbelievable. You were so good. But truthfully, though, you know, Leah, I went more for marketing. I took all the marketing electives. I ended up with, like, you know how we're supposed to have, like, 120 hours of credit? I had 97 hours of credit with marketing by itself. And so. That's why I changed my degree in marketing. I was just like, huh? Because, you know, the, the thing the camel that broke the camel, or the straw that broke the camel's back was, you know, we're all students. You know, the uh, Mac on campus, I won the student of the month, and they, they gave the school 1500 bucks under my name. And I was like, Miss Finch, I would like to finish school. You know, Mac on campus will not answer crickets. I called, they're like, we'll call you back. Never call back. They just absolutely zero, like, they don't want me there. You know, I just, Eighteen hundred dollars. I'm not giving them winning. And I was like, hey guys, you know, and I was just like, yeah. What was the company? Oh, it's just like the Mac on campus. Remember that company? I can't yeah. Yeah, I yeah, they do the pocket wizards. I was chosen as a student of the month because you know, and so yeah, and so it sucked too because you know, I told for three years I was told, telling people like, hey, it's a fun. There was a lot of hating on you. Yeah. I mean, it was everywhere you went. Man. But I mean, you know, hey, that's what the leader, that's what happens when you're a leader. I mean, that's, you know, so welcome to the, you know. Yeah, it's just, but you know what? I wake up every morning and I realize this is a luxury. There's no one, this is never going to be a necessity. You know, this isn't nursing. This isn't any of that. This is fun. And I am thankful every day that I get to do so. Photography mm -hmm. and dogs. I mean, that's the joy of my life as far yeah. as what I do with dogs. Dogs of them and stuff like yeah, go ahead. Taking pictures of them and stuff like that. That's the joy of my life. Yeah. Uh, that's, and it's it's and it's great and it's it's a luxury. It's a joy. It's, <laughs> all the time. You have you you follow me on Facebook, right? Oh yeah. So actually, uh, that's where I got a 
You see my business partner? No, but did you did you see my business partner? As soon as you see her eyes, yeah. As soon as you see her eyes, you're like, what? So I love that woman. So. But um, yeah, that was yeah. I follow you on Facebook. I watch your stuff all the time. Absolutely, and I tell everyone. As far as technical, he's anal. One of the best in the world. Huh. Several photographers that we were in there with no, um, the guys right ahead of us. Mm -hmm. right ahead of us. Yeah, Damien, uh, Damien and Gustavo. I haven't seen them in a while. Yeah. Was it a, was it Amanda or was it a Amanda? Yeah, the one that looked like uh, what's her name? Uh, the one that looked like Ann Geds type yeah, photos. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. Was that a yeah. Was it a, was it Amanda or no? I don't remember, but it was. You said it. I remember because we've been friends with her on Facebook. I've even I even referred someone to her for a wedding, mm -hmm. long, two years ago. You know, right after I got out of school. But, uh, Is he happy uh, now? Matter of fact, I referred him to both of y'all, but I think they actually wound up using. Right? Hey guys, uh, hey Rodney, let other people shoot. She's gonna be here for a while. Hey guys, cycle through. Let everyone uh, let everyone shoot. Use the triggers if you guys can. So. Sorry about that, Charles. Oh, that's so, right, And I am, uh, I guess I am anal in a certain way like that right there. I am anal in a certain way to tell people what to do. You so, should be. Technically, you're the best. I mean, you're the no, best. No, no. So, no. technically, so. I'm thankful. I still play in Photoshop a lot. I didn't have a trigger. Oh, yeah, I know, sir. I'm just going to, you know. So. I got a question. That's good to see, see you. Buddy. <laughs> so. How does it work with the uh, membership and everything? Because I was here at that one class for Lightroom. Yeah, well, and then I... yeah, the membership is any of these member events. You pay 25 bucks. You remember it for the year. I mean, last year, if you, if you go over, whatever, um, and you just come to any member event. And so you just pay 20. It really is like we don't import, we don't look at memberships. But we just try to make it so worth it where people are like, you know what? It's worth my money. You know, even one class, there's been a few people already who are like, this 25 bucks covers just this one session that I already had. And so these are, these are, they're all like this. They go in depth and it's really just like, you have a question, it's, you know, here's a consultant who does photography will answer any question you have as long as it's within this threshold of, you know, information we're giving. And so the membership, you pay 25 bucks, you have it for the year, you know, and then you, if it says, if it says MAS member event, open so do i need to pay again tonight no no it's a it's a just a, if you paid it before you don't have to pay it again and so and if you want to give us anything feel free but if you want to yeah, so, yeah. oh, so. hmm? oh sorry is it not fitting on there right sorry one second uh it goes on forward and uh and yeah it goes on forward and if it's tightened up yeah actually did it get? Yeah, it should, but it's uh, it's just really tight. So, and what we want to do is make sure that nothing was adjusted here, and that's it. It's firing. There you go. So. Yeah. Okay. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. I had to shoot a, an event at the aquarium, and they had mm -hmm. that big ballroom in there where mm -hmm. it's got a really tall ceiling, and it's really dull up there. And I was having a hard time shooting people, and mm -hmm. they were getting awards and stuff. Yep. And I was like, What's the best way to use my speed light? Like, what what bad, camera? Bad at it. What camera do you have? It's a, it's a Rebel. It's a Rebel. I've had it for a while, but I'm, I'm about to upgrade. But I just got this new Photix. At my choice. And so what you want to do there is you want to balance the available light because with the uh, I mean more than likely there's up lighting there's you know the color there yeah. you stand your subject where it's really dark yeah. and that illuminates them but you balance it with the background so you're at iso 1600 you're at iso you're at like one or 4.0 at 1 60th of a second that picks up your background but since they're standing in darkness your light is what's illuminating them so you get your subject as well lit by your flash but also the mood and the ambience of the background and that's what's critical because you don't want them to look like that award was gotten anywhere you want it to look like it's gotten where and so with proper experience I and mean, it's i can give you the settings now but it's one of those where so you would suggest just staying on manual and manual. No, no, automatic on this. Automatic on this. But manual on that. And you put it at six ISO sixteen hundred, F four, F four point five, at one sixtieth of a second. And if you get too much light in, change your shutter speed. You know, so on. And when you do that, this illuminates your subject 
and the background's illuminated by how long your exposure is. And that's how you consistently get, you know, because uh, let me see if I have example shots. Um, My boss is trying to tell me to stay on program, so uh, program is uh, screwing me up. I'm used to working with Manny. Depending on the program is not a bad mode to do it, but program doesn't necessarily know what you're aiming for. Mm -hmm. And so, by putting it on manual, you're going to get more consistent photos. Right. And so, let me see if I. Oh yeah, I'm not. I'm not finished. I mean, he's just getting really tired because he's been out all day. So this is an example of shooting. He's like, oh, oh, I want to go to bed. <laughs> He's like, I'll kill you if you don't take me home. What a brat. All right. So, so this is oh, yeah. an example. And so you're picking up the ambience of the background at a higher ISO while you're also using your flash to illuminate your subject. I'm at. Is it award-winning stuff? Absolutely not. But is it what your clientele or what your boss is asking for? Exactly. You know, it's your subject illuminated with the background that they paid for. Okay. Gotcha. One thing that is nice when you're doing that at an event, if you compare what people usually do with their own cameras, you get sphere that. Hey guys, for anyone who's online, thank you for staying with us. I'm gonna go ahead and let you guys go. Um, it's actually nice to. Uh, Nice for all of everyone who joined us. It was a great class. Uh, if there was anything I missed, feel free to message me or email me. Is that Aaron? Oh my God. Yeah, just blue steel screen. I wish you guys were here to shoot her. This is what we do. We try to get members to get something really unique. So take care, guys. I'll see you soon.